Doug Black, can you hear me? All right, good morning, everybody. On this Tuesday, it is 9 uh, Mountain Time. As a matter of fact, it's 9.01 Mountain Time, but it's a very special day today. We have just, as, as if you follow me on Twitter, you know, if you follow me on Facebook, you know that we have just, uh, my wife Carrie and I, walked our little guy Wyatt uh, to his first day in the classroom, his first day of in-class learning he is the king of kindergarten today, to quote one of our favorite storybooks, one of the books we love to read, Wyatt. Of course, we read it last night before he fell asleep on the eve of his first day. For, for you parents that have been there before, and don't worry, by the way, if you're, if you're just tuning in, you only want to talk politics, pipelines, and serious business. That's coming up in a minute. Don't worry. I know that on the first day of school, sometimes people are, people are lamenting the fact that their social feeds are full of photos of kids and families in the first day of school. Well, I do not and will not apologize. Nor should I, you. No, I will not apologize this morning, Sam Brooks. Uh, by the way, Sam, here bright and early at the crack of dawn today, still making sure that everything was ready to go. Thank you very much for that, my friend. Appreciate it. So here we are. Uh, our family, a big, huge day for our family. Uh, Wyatt Rudy heading in for his first day. So here he was this morning. He was very excited, of course, as you can imagine. Fresh backpack, ready to go. Look at that. Picked out his outfit I'm himself. All over this dino backpack. That thing is great. Sam, the backpack glows in the dark. What? Yeah, pal. Uh, Wyatt was testing it out last night, making sure that it could glow. He is so excited for this. So we so we made the walk together, a very special walk. The snow is like lightly falling. It was out of a storybook this morning. Such a special moment. I know that this dad is never going to forget it. Um, he let me put him up on my shoulders for a little bit. Of course, once we got closer to school, he was he wanted to walk himself. He wanted he to walk cool in for himself. He, well, not so much too cool, but I think he was just the excitement was was like coursing through him. <laughs> and so uh, Carrie and I had a had a, a pretty special walk back home from school, just the two of us, uh, sorting through our feelings. Uh, but it's a very exciting morning, you know, of I course. Of, I was thinking about this yesterday. Like, Wyatt 
is going to have his first day of school ever in in snow. Like very few kids actually get that because most That's kids start in September. Like That's a very good yeah. point. Yeah. And he's and so he's like he's figuring out a lot of the a lot of the new stuff. Um, you know, like even okay, so you think of when you walk in the front door and there is his teacher. We're obviously not going to say the school, not going to say the teacher's name, all that kind of stuff. But but she's sitting there at the front door of the school and she's so he is the only student that's joining class right now. Oh, wow. Yeah. Cool. So the rest of the so Edmonton Public has been doing a really great job. Edmonton Public School Board, if you're watching from outside the city. Uh, and uh, there, there were sort of four mile markers through the year where the kids could could if you were learning at home, if you were doing the di- distance or the online learning. And by the way, a huge shout out to the teachers and the organizers that have been managing that. They've been doing an amazing job. But there were four times through the year you could go back. And so this is the time that Wyatt's going back, but he's the only kid. So, so this is kind of an interesting scenario for him because he's entering this classroom. All the other kids have been there, but he knows a few of them from preschool. So there are a few familiar faces. So we're thinking, of, I mean, I'm thinking of my little guy right now. He's, 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 he's 34 minutes into his first day of kindergarten. Pretty special stuff. Our, our guest hitting leadoff for us this morning, I know, has walked in these boots before. Uh, he's a parent, he's a very proud grandparent, and you know what, I'm, I'm kind of thinking it might be pretty appropriate if we could get Senator Doug Black to, to maybe regale us with, uh, with a couple of the stories that he, Sam, is, is Senator ready to go? Okay, um, I'm not seeing him, maybe that's what's going on here, the monitor, I'm, I'm, uh, I was waiting for Doug Black to come up on camera here, um, but I don't see our first guest. Senator, can you hear me? Oh, there we are. Okay, but I think you're, I think you're on mute. I get to hold up this sign from our friends at Punch Card. Yeah, there we go. How's we'll that? Get it figured. There you are, my man. How are you? Good morning, and congratulations to you and Carrie. <laughs> Thank this you. Is a, I mean, it's a big day for Wyatt, but let's be honest. It's just as big a day for you and Carrie. This is a proud, proud day that you get, the, you get to the point that you're able to take your child to school, and he walks in that door. And you walk away. It's not particularly easy, but it's important. And I'm pretty proud of you and Carrie for uh, getting Wyatt to that point, that he was confident enough to do that this morning. Yeah, well, I appreciate that, Senator. Do you do you have a, a vivid memory of, oh my I, I know you've got kids, you've got grandkids, so maybe you have oh. sort of <laughs> double whammy here. It was one of the nicest days for my wife and I in the calendar. The, the excitement, the laying out the clothes the night before, the confidence, it was beautiful. And, you know, many years ago, my wife and I started a school. So the concept of the first day of school is really important to us because it's renewal. It's revival. It's building confidence. It's building independence. And uh, listen, if I could do it again, I would do it all over again. I thought it was one of the best days in the calendar. Yeah, it's uh, there's some about it. There was there was. Uh, oh, yeah. It's and I remember it, we're walking there and I'm thinking like this is uh, you only do this once. There, there's only one time that you're going to walk your kid, your little guy to school for the yep. first time, you yep. know, pretty soon before I know it, yeah. he's going to be telling me to beat it. Right. So, oh, you take that to the bank. You will <laughs> be able to get him within about a block. And then it is not cool to be holding dad's hand walking to school been there <laughs> yeah no kidding no kidding oh, it's too much fun. <laughs> uh, senator i let, let, let's i just want to roll right hot into this interview we've got a, a, a bit of a you late bet. start this morning it's it's kind of great i like it it's breaking up the week we ease in at 9 a.m here but uh of course it, it doesn't mean that uh, everybody else isn't paying attention to what's going on in ottawa and across the country and i'm and i'm grateful that you're here to, to check in with us on a number you of bet. files I'm, i know that people well, will be interested i mean you you join us from the you know you have the perspective of a canadian you have the perspective of a senator as well so why don't we start with the vaccine uh story there's yeah. there's kind of two stories two main ones here i think uh number one procurement uh number two distribution so your perspective on the job the federal government's doing, we heard from Carrie Tate from the Globe and Mail yesterday. She was trying to help us keep our perspective here on, on the outrage factor. Well, look, I don't want to seem unnecessarily critical. I like to be as constructive as I can. But on this complete vaccine management issue, on the complete pandemic management issue, I think the government has shown us that they cannot manage a one-horse parade. They can't manage this, whether it was early on identification, whether it was PPE, it continues to be testing, it continues to be tracing, they cannot get their act together. We all know, 
We are not getting our get out of jail card until we get vaccinated. This is the only job that the government of Canada should have been worrying about for months. And here we are now, and I've been endeavoring to get their contracts for months. The reason they won't show them is we do not have, in my judgment, firm commitments. We have targets. And we are now seeing that those targets aren't being met. So the government decides that yesterday we should put more money into manufacturing vaccines in Canada. That should have started months ago. In December, I was raising in the Senate, where is the Made in Canada solution? And here we are on February 2nd, them trying to roll this out. Like, I am just telling you, Canadians should be fundamentally disappointed with this. We are now 22nd in the world in the amount of Canadians that have been vaccinated. What is a this made is in, just, What do you mean, though, a made-in-Canada solution? I mean, are you talking about the yeah. research, the development, the manufacturing, I mean, all within Canadian borders? Yes, and there's the ability to do it. There is certainly a company in Calgary that's got generated a lot of press over the last couple of weeks. They have the same technology as the Pfizer and the Moderna vaccine, the uh, RNA technology. Uh, they have only started clinical trials last week because the government of Canada was delayed in sending them the amount of money, less than the amount of money they requested. They have the capacity, they, they have the scientific capacity, and they now have the capacity to manufacture. All they need is support. Similarly, there are other, it's just not here, there are other companies in Canada. We've seen uh, reports this morning of Novavax getting further support from the government of Canada. That's just great. But they have to continue. They have to complete the construction of their lab, Ryan. Like Ryan, this should have started months ago. So there is the ability. Let me also tell you, you and your listeners, that at the start of this pandemic, the UK, just like Canada, had no capacity to manufacture vaccine. The UK is manufacturing vaccine as we speak today because they understood that they had, they could not rely on other countries in the way that we have done. And so they moved ahead and they are producing vaccine now. And indeed, after I believe Israel, and I'm going to say UAE, the UK has the highest incident of vaccination in the world. There is no excuse for, the, for where Canadians are finding themselves today. And Canadians should not be accepting this. This is not acceptable in my view. Yeah, I, uh, I'm just not, I'm not convinced that Canadians are convinced uh, because my, my job, I don't think, is to always come up with the hot theories and opinions, but it certainly is mm -hmm. to gauge the ones that I see. And I don't know that Canadians mm -hmm. believe that as a country uh, that we've prioritized the type of research or invested in the types of labs that would be able to make this happen. So is it we realistic haven't. to suggest that we're going to be able to pull this off in the middle of a pandemic and put it all on the shoulders of the federal government? We are so far behind the ball. But yes, I am told that, that we have the capacity. We have the capacity to begin manufacturing in the next number of months. There's fit out to be done. There's things to be done, which incidentally should have been done months ago. But I am told by summer, end of summer, early fall, we can be manufacturing vaccine in Canada. That's good, Ryan. And I mean, I've been calling for a made in Canada solution for months. That's good. I'm just telling you, it's late. It's way late because we can't get back to life until we're able to move around freely. I just, And I don't understand why the government has not understood from day one that this is the, the only job of a government is to protect its population. That's the only job, the number one job of government. And um, I know for, you know, as an Alberta senator, I find this completely unacceptable, completely. I, I unacceptable. have to say you and I have been speaking for years now. Uh, yeah. and, and, and this is the most candid. I mean, you're, you're always a candid interview. You always tell us what you think. You're you're you've, you're typically quite diplomatic. I think that these are the the uh, the highest fastballs that I've seen. There's a little chin music here. Are, are you a little more perturbed than normal? Yes, absolutely. I mean, 
I obviously am deeply concerned about pipelines, and economic recovery, and the other issues that I deal with all day long. But Ryan, 20,000 Canadians have died. There are more Canadians will die today. This is not an academic conversation. Get the vaccine into people's arms. That's the job of government, to look after the population. And uh, I, I, I hope I don't appear angry. I'm not angry. I'm just frustrated because this is not a secret. This started over a year ago, Ryan, and we shouldn't be endeavoring to play catch up day after day after day. Remember, our first solution here was to get the vaccine from the Chinese. Like, you can't make that up, Ryan. The Chinese have two of our citizens in jail that we had contracted with the Chinese to provide personal protective equipment. Yeah, they I mean, did not. I'm, I mean, come on. Sure. I mean, and hey, you know me. I, I always try to be reasonable. I mean, we also sell our oil sands facilities to the Chinese. I mean, if we're if we're going to if we're going to start blacklisting China and everything because of the two Michaels, uh, we got a long list of of the deals we got to start blowing up. Would you agree? Well, I would say this. I would say yes, but if you need something fundamentally, you're best to rely on A, yourself, B, your friends and family. So I'm just saying that I don't think China, a country for whom I have great respect, do not fall into those categories. And uh, I mean, we just, I, I, I just cannot believe that after being let down on the personal protective equipment. We then tried to do a deal with the Chinese to manufacture a vaccine. And guess what, Ryan? The material that we needed to manufacture the vaccine, which was going to be done in Halifax in Montreal, was held up by export permits in Beijing. Now, maybe that was just a coincidence, Ryan. Maybe that was just a coincidence. But when that happened, the government of Canada was completely out of options. So that's when they had to rush around the world, entering all of these contracts with governments, you know, with companies who can manufacture vaccine. And that's great. That's a great initiative. But I don't believe those contracts provide definite amounts and dates for provision of material. As we saw last week, Pfizer sent absolutely no doses to Canada last week. One would think in contravention of the agreement. And on the um, Moderna one, Moderna has told us they're going to pull back their supplies to Canada by 40%. I'm a lawyer, Ryan. That is a breach of contract if you have an enforceable contract which my guess is Canada does not. Yeah, well, I'm, I'm watching countries all over, all over the world uh, cry foul about the vaccine rollout and, and different countries mm -hmm. are being affected in different ways. And, and, and mm -hmm. I'm not sure. I mean, if you want to tie something up in the courts, I'm going to get out of my depth here if I start talking about international trade law. But I suspect that that's not going to be the most effective approach here. What is a what is effective management of this right now look like to you? We are very late in the day, but if I were the Prime Minister of Canada, I would obviously be putting as much pressure as I possibly could on the providers who've indicated they're going to provide to us. A. B. I would be ensuring that Health Canada expedites approvals of additional vaccines which are coming forward, and they are. Johnson & Johnson, and there's another company I can't remember. I would be moving that forward safely but expeditiously. No bureaucratic shuffle on that point. And thirdly, I would be putting whatever it takes to ensure that we can manufacture in Canada because we have COVID now, but we also know we have variants and we may need vaccine boosters for the variants. So well, that's what I would be doing. It would be three-pronged and I would stop all the chitter-chatter and the I've got your back and whatever else goes on. That would be the plan and they need to get serious about it. And if his officials are not serious about it, I would replace his officials today so that's what i would do but i'm not the prime minister i want to uh i'm, I'm curious for your take on uh, you know keystone xl i know that there's a, you know i'm tempted to to ignore some of the big stories we send, spend so much time talking about them that i feel like we ignore about a hundred other things that are going on yeah but i know that you know a senator based out of alberta is bound to have probably a pretty deep perspective 
on Keystone XL. Uh, President uh, Joe Biden pulls the permit on this like as one of his first orders of business. People were saying, well, I mean, we saw this coming from a mile away. Not everybody did. Uh, Alberta's premier didn't think it was getting pulled or he probably wouldn't have, you know, spent a minimum of a billion and a half dollars on that pipeline trying to keep it alive. What, what's your assessment? First of all, I want to ask you, we'll go with different levels of government, the federal government. You think there's anything that Prime Minister Trudeau could have or should have done or should be doing on this? I'm so disappointed with Keystone. I mean, I, I'm not surprised that we ended up with the decision that we've ended up with. But I'm very surprised that the Biden administration would not have engaged uh, more fulsome on a more fulsome basis with Ottawa and Edmonton, because the keystone today is not the keystone of 10 years ago when Barack Obama revoked the presidential permit. Uh, so I am surprised we weren't given an opportunity to put our case forward. But there it is. I mean, there there it is. So what we need to be extraordinarily mindful of is four things on the pipeline file. One, recognize that we're, we operate in a very tough neighborhood on this file because there are very sophisticated, well-funded interests who are winning each battle in preventing Alberta from getting its product to market. So we have to watch the so-called line five, which is a line which runs from Wisconsin through Michigan up to Sarnia. It provides 400,000 barrels a day to Ontario and 400,000 barrels a day to Quebec. There is obviously, Michigan has told Enbridge to close the pipeline down. Enbridge has refused that and is providing service to Enbridge's credit. We need to ensure that we take this very seriously. The government of Canada, line five is essential. We, I mean, I would argue for the US, but it is essential for Ontario and Quebec. For example, all the jet fuel at Pearson is provided from product that comes uh, into Canada from Line 5. Line 3, which runs from Alberta down to the U.S., is essential as well. Uh, they are doing upgrading work now. There's obviously pressure to try and stop that. We need to pay attention to that. TMX must get built, must get built, and we have to do whatever is required to ensure that. And finally, I'm quietly talking to people, suggesting to people, listening to people about the possibility of reviving a gateway project, aboriginally led, potentially aboriginally owned, from Fort Mac through to Prince Rupert or Kitimat, so we can move the heavy oil product that's required by Asia and other nations. That would re require us cancelling the outrageous tanker ban that this government put on, to penalize Alberta, to further punish Alberta. But I believe if the pipeline were supported and led by First Nations interests, I believe that's a possibility. So we have to continue our work on the pipeline file because if we are stranded, if our asset is stranded, we will continue to see the economic uh, problems that we have been having because of the success of that exercise so that's i mean a long-winded answer to say this file is far from closed i think keystone likely is closed so we have to look at other opportunities yeah i have a million questions from everything you just said uh from from the well-organized why well-financed efforts to shut down alberta oil i want to circle back on that to you to whether or not there's actually indigenous yeah. interest expressed in in northern gateway 2.0 and what you think might be any mm -hmm. different about you know getting those mm -hmm. pulled um you, you talk about the federal government the tanker ban uh, I will acknowledge the tanker ban is hypocritical if you take a look at, at our how Canada manages its its eastern yep. shore. Uh, yep. In other words, no oh. tanker ban. And I think that there are easily as many susceptible, uh, you know, species of wildlife, marine life, uh, obviously coastline to protect water sources, etc. But do you I, I want to push back a little bit when you say the federal government's tanker ban to punish Alberta. Now, it may punish Alberta to a certain degree with economic implications, as legislation mm -hmm. often does in different jurisdictions. But but you don't mm -hmm. actually believe the federal government is intentionally punishing Alberta, do you? I believe that the Bill C-48 was designed to continue to strangle the, ass the heavy oil assets at Fort McMurray and Cold Lake. Yes, I do. Yes, I do. And the most effective way, obviously, to strangle that is to ensure you can't get your product out. <clears throat> so what does that mean? That means either preventing pipelines from being built or from having products shipped. To your excellent point you just made, Ryan, 
this oil tanker ban on the north coast of British Columbia, which I believe was targeted, it's discriminatory, it's just, it's appalling legislation, was targeted as I've indicated. It is the only oil tanker ban in the world, not just in Canada, in the world. There's no tanker ban in Sydney, Australia, or Rotterdam, or Houston, or as you correctly point out, Montreal, St. John, Placentia Bay. <laughs> yeah, but you know, I mean, if you change, if you change your tone of voice, uh, mm -hmm. that's something that you know, depending on the audience, you may consider it to be something to brag about, right? You, you you can also puff up your chest and pop your collar and say it's the only tanker ban of its kind in the world, right? Correct. If you want to talk about how you're and, protecting your coastline, if you want on. the social, oh, no, you know, et cetera, et cetera, right? Mm -hmm. And I'm not, and I haven't fact-checked that, but, but I don't I know if there's another you, fact. I don't know a, if there is one or not. Well, I, 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 of course, have, because I led the charge against C-48 in the uh, Senate and House Commons, so I have fact-checked that. But I would say to you, if you raise that point, and you're right, people have raised that point, I'd say, well, then, okay, got it. If the coast of British Columbia is so important to whatever your agenda is, how come oil tankers can come in and out of Vancouver? Explain that one to me. <clears throat> Why does the tanker ban just start at the north end of Vancouver Island? Well, yeah, I mean, you, you, so, you'd, uh, it's, it's a little, it's a little hypocritical. It's a little hypocritical. Sure. <clears throat> and, uh, I mean, you know, I'm here, here, let me, let me be clear what's going on here. Okay. This is, this is two yeah. old chums that have known each other for a long time chewing the fat. I'm not here to defend the federal yeah. government on something, but I will say, I, it. I think it's, I com it. it's completely unrealistic to suggest that there should be a tanker ban in van. If you want to, if you want to shut down the entire Canadian economy, start talking about tanker bans, uh, you know, shut down tankers coming into Vancouver. Like, I dare a federal government to even talk about that. That's not even realistic for a second. Uh, some people would believe that you should for the right whales, the orcas, and, and all the other populations I don't know enough about, but that's not realistic. So I think some people are probably taking a look at the federal government and saying on, you know, on the indigenous file, like with regards to reconciliation, what are you going to do that represents meaningful action there? On the environmental front, what are you going to do that represents meaningful action there? I mean, we're going to be talking later this week to, to, I mean, people that are digging into the announcements from some of the huge auto manufacturers like General Motors. Senator, you and I can both acknowledge that, you know, a 15 year window to phase out fossil fuel driven vehicles, uh, fossil fuel powered vehicles is I mean, that that's happening now. And I think some right, people are going to say what what represents leadership from the federal government? Mm -hmm. oh, look, and I think that's a great thing. And I think it's a great opportunity for Alberta as well, incidentally. All I'm saying on the, on the particular file, and we can close this conversation, is that uh, there is a demand and will be for the next 30 or 40 years for heavy oil from Alberta. I mean, whether we like it or whether we don't like it, there are nations around the world that want the product. It can be and is on a daily basis shipped around the world. And I'm not sure why the only source that is not able to ship would be the oil sands in Alberta is yeah. all I'm saying. Let me ask Am you. I saying that, uh, you know, that's all I'm saying. I'm just, I'm just saying, let's be equitable about this. Let's be reasonable about this. Uh, and uh, I was make one last point. Do, you, do we have any idea how many tankers are pulling into Montreal today? There's no suggestion. This is down the narrow St. Lawrence. There's no suggestion. Well, I mean, yeah, that, that shouldn't or couldn't happen. I, I think it should happen. I'm going to get agitated if we start talking if we start talking about the St. Lawrence and Montreal, and I mean, because people are right. I mean, mm -hmm. Montreal mm -hmm. pumps like you know Olympic swimming pools full of sewage into the St. Lawrence, and nobody seems to worry about it. Right. We, but we've heard all right. these arguments. Right. I mean, that's that's kind of the mm -hmm. whole point. As I watch Alberta's premier, you know, argue on behalf of the province on Fox News and CNBC and Power and Politics and all these shows. I mean, he, he's banging the same drum that they've been banging for 20 years. The argument hasn't changed. Nothing's changed. Everybody knows what he's going to say. I mean, I could I could make a Jason Kenney speech right now for 20 minutes. Let me be clear. And I could deliver the whole speech and there'd be no new material. So how do you mm -hmm. assess how the provincial government, the Alberta provincial government has done on the KXL file? Well, I would say to you that I would, again, if I were the premier in this case, as opposed to the prime minister, I would recognize that there are absolutely tremendous things going on in this economy. We don't hear a lot about it because 
you know, we're, we're in such a complicated situation now with the pandemic and the economic challenges. But I would be focusing on obviously sustaining and protecting through innovation the existing oil and gas industry. It's important. It matters and needs to be protected. But there's fantastic things going on here in agriculture and through innovation in financial services in all kinds of startups that are occurring in Calgary or Edmonton. So I would be focusing on what I've always called Alberta 2.0. That's what I would be focusing on and and make those arguments. This is not Alberta of 10 years ago. We are a new Alberta. We have new challenges, substantial challenges, but we're going to meet all these challenges and there's going to be tremendous opportunity for us. That's what I'd be building on. Let's uh, let's wrap with a look ahead to what Alberta 2.0 looks like in your eyes and what's required right now, because, uh, you know, the markets are global. Uh, job competition is global. Everything's global, obviously. And I think if you're asleep at the switch or if you have a lack of direction or a lack of awareness or a lack of funding or whatever the case is over the course of 12 to 48 months, uh, I think it could be devastating for a jurisdiction like Alberta. So what does it look like and what will it take to get there? Again, what I what I would focus on is what does the future look like? We have huge opportunities here in this province around other sources of energy. We have huge opportunities around hydrogen. I would be driving hydrogen to find out, because we have, I think, the second or third largest supply of hydrogen in the world. How do we capture on a global basis that market? I also understand we have tremendous lithium opportunities Who knew from the brine which is created when you drill for oil and gas? Lithium is key for batteries. I'd be driving that. I would be doing whatever can be done to lower the carbon footprint. And we are doing that with great success. I'd be looking at carbon capture and storage. And I would be positioning Alberta as the green tech leader of the world insofar as we can. That's what I would focus on. A, B, agriculture can't spend enough time and enough money on agriculture and agribusiness. We have huge opportunities there. And then thirdly, I would be supporting fully all in on the innovation startups that are happening in this province. We saw just today that a new uh, company, 100 employees, is relocating from British Columbia to Alberta because they like the fact that we have talented people, we have a great environment, we have cheap office space, all of the above. So I would be going all in on that. So it's new energy, it's agriculture, and it's innovation. And part of innovation, and I've seen on my virtual tour, is our broadband service, rural broadband service, is not acceptable in this province. Serious money has got to go at that fast because all of the communities outside of the big cities, and even in some part of the big cities, are not able to consistently and dependably work go to school and do their business because their service is intermittent that that's a barrier to prosperity and we need to get right at we need to get right after that and i've been calling for that and i've seen that in my virtual tour around the province it's yeah. like after mental health it's the number two issue that i hear most about is that right rural blo- rural broadband mental health number one rural broadband number two that's interesting. You know what? And and hey, then we'll, we'll have people tuning in from indigenous communities. They're going to say, yeah, you want to talk about rural broadband? Believe it or not, we don't have they're, they're going to say we, we've been under a boil water advisory since the 1980s. Uh, we've got a long list of, of uh, issues that we need to fix. Senator, this virtual tour, uh, before I let you go, I'd be remiss if I didn't ask you specifically about it. What's been going on? Is it still happening? People can chime in. Can people talk to you directly? Oh, no, it's fantastic. I've now visited 14 communities in Alberta over the last number of weeks. The only community that I have yet to visit is Calgary. I'm going to do two virtual days in Calgary in the next couple of weeks. So I've been in every corner of the province, communities big, communities small, talking to political leaders, social, uh, you know, community leaders, food bank leaders, leaders in the homeless community, First Nations leaders, labor leaders. I've talked to the gambit of Albertans uh, because I wanted to hear from them. My commitment to Albertans is to stay committed and connected, and I have tried to do that. Um, So I had incredible, I've talked to thousands of people now who've told me about their worries, their concerns, their anxieties, 
and boiling it down. Uh, you know, what I've seen is Albertans are extraordinarily resilient and extraordinarily compassionate. In every community, I see that. In most smaller communities, giving to social service agencies is actually up during this year because people see the, uh, tr the, the trials that people are having. So resilient and compassion. The issues, though, are mental health. I am deeply, deeply concerned about the impact that the pandemic, uh, coupled with the economic challenges that were existing for three or four years before the pandemic, have caused for Albertans, and we have to take this very, very seriously. What does that look like and to you? I mean, don't, don't, and don't just say funding, oh, yeah. because we can always, we, we believe that we can throw money at mm -hmm. something, but, I mean, it's, that's not insignificant. But what's the solution, do you think? Um, the solution is for people like you and I, Ryan, to be talking openly on a daily basis about this problem, because for too long it's been ignored. So, A, we need to talk about it openly and recognize we need to deal with it. What does dealing with it look like? It obviously requires funds, but it requires, for example, let's take the instant of Medicine Hat three or four months ago. They unfortunately, to use their words, not mine, had an epidemic of male suicides. Males between, say, 25 and 34, family guys, hockey buddies, children. And there was literally a number of young men. It was like a number of young men took their lives. The government of Alberta, to their credit, saw this and sent in basically a SWAT team of professional advisors to help the community. That is going to have to happen on a broader basis because where it plays out, suicide is the far end of the spectrum, but it plays out in, uh, oh my God, I'm seeing some awful things, you know, homelessness, drug addiction, opioid use, Abuse, both women on men and men on women. Uh, abuse of children. It is a serious issue that we need to take seriously. Number two, broadband, as I've mentioned. And then number three, are just a growing weariness about vaccine. And that's why I was so animated at the top of this podcast, because I'm hearing it from everyone, that they cannot see their grandchildren. They cannot go to work. They can't go to the co-op. They can't go to the doctor because they're not vaccinated. They don't feel safe. The community doesn't feel safe. So I am just out of time for people making excuses as to why Canada is now 22nd in the world. And then finally, there's the issue of economic recovery that we can talk about another time. I'm spending a, a lot of my time on uh, working with people to craft what an economic recovery looks like. But that's that would be for, that would be for another conversation. But it's all part of it, and I've been calling for months for the government of Canada to devise a strategy for economic recovery. They haven't, uh, so that's fine. They haven't. So we work around it. We work with the province. We work with industry groups. We work with uh, think tanks who want to have a role in ensuring that our recovery is rob robust. All right. So, uh, I, I you and I both know the federal government is developing a strategy for economic recovery, but if it, it, it doesn't, if it's not to your satisfaction, that can be your opinion, but obviously they're developing a strategy for economic recovery. We know that. I don't know that. Ah, I, I can tell you exactly. I'll, I'll tell you exactly what I know. I called for an economic recovery commission last March. Nothing happened. There was something called the economic strategy round table, which was currently existing. So they, they decided to boot that up. And that's great, led by a fantastically talented woman from Montreal. They brought together, uh, you know, various leaders around what they styled to be tables. All of these tables submitted to the government of Canada about two and a half months ago now, their reports on the various sectors. They have not released those. I have requested two or three times from both former Minister Baines and the coordinator of the strategy tables Share with us your plans. Nothing. So I want to believe there's a plan, but if there's a plan, why is it secret, right? Yeah. What, 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 like, why, why can't we know what is the plan? Alberta, to their credit, has a plan. Alberta has devised a plan and they're executing I, a plan. Well, I, I am going to respectfully absolutely disagree with you on that, Senator, but okay. that's totally okay. fine. I actually think that Alberta is in real trouble right now under our current leadership, but I'm going to use my own time to talk about that. I appreciate yeah. your time this morning. Thank you for making yourself available to us.
I really appreciate the opportunity to get back together with you. So thanks very much. I would love to do this again if it works. You got it, Senator. Uh, That's Senator Doug Black, uh, uh, elected senator out of Alberta. Um, sitting as an independent senator, Eric's watching in this morning. He says it's not hard to tell where your guest, Senator Black's political affiliations lie. Uh, yeah, obviously, uh, I think a strong conservative perspective this morning. Tell your friends a strong conservative perspective on Real Talk this morning. Um, it, it, there, there's a lot we got to go through. So the good news is uh, Art Price, by the way, we've rescheduled Art Price for tomorrow. He's the former CEO of Husky Energy. Uh, I mean, he's got some really strong opinions on how Alberta's provincial government and the federal government drop the ball on Keystone XL. We're going to get into that. Doug Black just opened like 150 cans that we've, we've got to get into. Northern Gateway 2.0, pulling the tanker ban. Um, Alberta under strong leadership with a clear economic plan. That's obviously preposterous to suggest. Um, Alberta does not have a plan, and Jason Kenney is ill-equipped to... Alberta 2.0 is not happening under Jason Kenney. Um, that that's a fact, you know, the, the guy's solutions, where do I even start, you know, devastating post-secondaries by pulling funding, you know, we're going to be the green energy capital of the world while we're fighting the federal government in court over a carbon tax. Like, are you kidding me? Um, optically it's a disaster. Uh, Jason Kenney's three and a half million dollars on the Allen inquiry, which is a complete joke, uh, which Sandy Garasino tore into yesterday on the show if you missed it. So Alberta does not have a plan. I have a ton of respect for Senator Black. I quite like him personally, but don't let anybody tell you in a kind, gentle voice that Jason Kenney has a plan for Alberta. Jason Kenney doesn't know which way is up right now. Uh, He exhibits that every single day. So uh, I'm curious for your take. I I see that the chatterbox is like smoking right now. And so we're going to get to some of your comments there. But of course, um, especially with the late start this morning, uh, if you're just tuning in, our little guy started kindergarten today. We walked him to school. So I'm riding a high right now. I'm like having the the most wonderful. The snow is falling outside our studio. It's absolutely beautiful. Oh, Sam, thank you. I look, I'm looking at the snow swirling out the window. I look up at our studio monitors in there. Oh, my gosh. Right in the heart. Right in the field. Um, somebody, uh, Ken wrote in earlier, I saw it, I don't have it in front of me right now, but Ken said something along the lines of, Ryan, I know what you're talking about. First day of school, he says, I don't have kids. And, you know, everyone, we see the photos and he says, but I can still get into it. It's called empathy. So thanks. Um, Let's remind you that our presenting sponsor of this show each and every day, regardless of what time we start, is Bitcoin. Well, uh, 2021 is uh, a big year. When you talk about economic recovery, what does that look like on your personal front? Uh, At no point am I going to tell you to sell your house, cash in your RSPs and put it all into Bitcoin. Although if you would have done that like a year ago, you'd be loaded right now. But... We don't offer stock tips, nor investment tips, nor crypto tips, but you know what? The team at Bitcoin Well can sort out all the questions you might have, plus they make it easy for you to buy and sell Bitcoin. They're proudly based right here in Alberta. You can check them out online, uh, Bitcoin Well, under the Sponsors tab at ryanjesperson.com. Our friends at Dairy Queen, I let them know yesterday, I said, hey, I said the real talkers are devastated that the two-for-one Dilly Bar deal's done. They said, well, pal... They said, Jespo, the reason we had to pull the two-for-one Dilly Bar deal is because we've got our Valentine's Day Cupid Cake promotion. It runs right now until uh, when all the fellas need it, which is day of, February 14th, Valentine's Day. Circle your calendars, by the way, guys. Valentine's Day is coming up February 14th. That's not one to miss. Anniversary, birthday, Christmas, Valentine's Day. I think those are the four you got to nail. Um, so here you go. The Cupid Cake, it's like a, it's like a two-person shareable blizzard cake. What is sixteen forty nine? Yeah, that's right. Under seventeen bucks for Valentine's Day, you can get it in red velvet cake, choco cherry love, and Oreo. It's available for a limited time. Sam, they've sent me the script for this, and they said, "But do your thing with it. Do your thing with choco cherry love." Choco Cherry Love. Choco Cherry Love sounds like somebody you meet on Bourbon Street and make memories with, doesn't it? Choco (laughs) Cherry Love. I don't even know what that means, man. Plus, we wanted to remind you that if you want to save money and breathe easy, an easy way to do it right now is to check out cleanairclub.ca. They know that we're all lazy or forgetful. We mean to change our furnace filters, but when it comes to the to-do list, it's the thing that always gets bumped. It always Do the dishes, walk the dog, change the furnace filter. Ah, right? They drop them off at your doorstep. Cleanairclub.ca is where Canadians are saving money and breathing easier, and we thank them for their partnership here on Real Talk. 
All right, Senator Doug Black joined us out of the gates. Love the guy. I think some of his opinions are, are partisan influenced, and, 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 I, and, I, and I don't actually think that he believes some. Well, I shouldn't speak for him. And if I'm going to say that, I should say it to his face. Uh, Doug knows I love him. Senator knows I love him. Uh, but uh, so I, I'm not surprised that some of you are pushing back. Somebody said to me, Ryan, why aren't you pushing back? I, I think I was pushing back. Um, but I wasn't banging on the table and screaming. Uh, I leave that to the chatterbox. <laughs> it's smoking right now. John, uh, Real Talk RJ hashtag on Twitter. John says, you know, Doug Black saying that Trudeau, everything he does is bad. But, but Jason Kenny, under Jason Kenny, Alberta has opportunities and the future is boundless. Does this guy live in reality? Wonders John. Uh, Dale, uh, Dale tweets at me. He says, you know, Senator Black's argument about tanker bans only starting north of Vancouver is the exact same thing as Jason Kenny's argument about coal mines. You know, they're already other places so let's open up protected lands and parks to mining uh, john says senator black on jespo sounds like he was one of the respondents to the allen inquiry um uh, jbm says senator you got to stop with the penalizing alberta tact it makes your otherwise coherent comments sound conspiratorial and tinfoil hat worthy that from uh, jbm um I know Senator Black to be a smart guy. He's a sharp guy, and he has been. I, do, I, I was a little disappointed to, to, to sort of hear him taking that tone, the, you know, the Jason Kenney, Vivian Krause, Steve Allen, everybody's piling on Alberta tone. The, the fact of the matter is, if there was such a, and, and you know, I, I would say prove me wrong, uh, that's exactly what the Alberta government is spending three and a half million of your dollars trying to do right now. And you'll say, well, that's a drop in the bucket to the one point five billion they wasted on Keystone. You're right. But still, let's not lose our perspective. You know, take the richest person, you know, three and a half million dollars is like three and a half million dollars is a lot to them. OK, three and a half million dollars is still a ton of dough. Uh, and if you're going to start talking about, you know, fiscal prudence and smart investments, then you might as well start with the small things. Three million here, five million there, 10 million here. That's where you can start to clean it up. If it was so easy to identify a foreign funded, which, by the way, can we just scratch that foreign funded? All we do is try to, you know, Jason Kenny pays advisors to go fly first class and stay in fancy hotels in London to try to do what? Secure foreign funding. Foreign funding is what makes the world go round. If you've paid, if you've played in something called the stock market, if you're aware of things called RSPs and mutual funds, if you, if you do anything to do with money in the world, you are participating in foreign funding. So let's get rid of that dumbass argument. Let's forget about foreign funding anything. All right. Foreign funding, good. Foreign funding, bad. Like, where are you going to draw the line? But is there a well-organized global campaign specifically targeting Alberta oil? There's not. Are there well-funded campaigns targeting the fossil fuel industry? Absolutely. Undeniably. Is Alberta on the list? Just like a bunch of American states and a bunch of other oil-producing nations? For sure. And that's driven by markets and trends and technology and global attitudes on things like the science of climate change. I mean, nothing that I'm saying, as far as I'm concerned, I try to be an open-minded guy. I always say to people, prove me wrong, change my mind. On Nothing that I have said to this point, in my opinion, is even up for debate. I, I mean, if Steve Allen could, could take the $3.5 million, including the nine hundred grand that goes right to his son's law firm, uh, if, if he could take that three and a half million dollars and whip together a report and say, I talked to the following players and I was able to easily identify and here with devastating, irrefutable evidence is proof that there is a, a well-financed foreign funded global campaign against Alberta oil. Then I would, you know what? I would, I would, I would look right into the camera right now and I would say I was wrong. I was wrong. I'm on board. Look at this. The whole world ganging up on Alberta. You ever go to like an all-inclusive in the Dominican Republic or Mexico or anywhere? You ever, you ever travel in Thailand or Bali or New Zealand and you talk to somebody and they say, where are you from? And you say, Lacombe, Grand Prairie, Edmonton. And they, and they kind of look at you and you go, Alberta. And they go, and you go, Canada. It's, it's, like, it's like above Montana. It's, it's kind of like above Idaho in a way. It's, 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 it's like about 10 hours, 12 hours from Seattle. And they go, oh, 
okay, yeah. Like nobody, like Alberta's not, you know, on the in the inauguration. Believe it or not, President Joe Biden did not interrupt his walk down Pennsylvania Avenue, uh, you know, behind the Beast limousine surrounded by Secret Service to take a call from Jason Kenney because Alberta's premier was upset. It's not how it works. You know, I'm not this is not this is in a way this is a, is, is a self-deprecating exercise. I'm a proud Alberta boy, but we need to keep our perspective here. The global trends are changing. And we got to pick a lane so we can either be the, the science denying, you know, carbon tax fighting, special inquiry funding, you know, patronage appointment, special inquiry funding, you know, Luddites, or we can get serious and start to talk about the, and I'm not even talking about, I'm not even talking about implementing green tech I'm not talking about making all of downtown Calgary solar powered. Start with the message. Start with the strategy. Start with the campaign. We're going to be the green tech capital of Canada. We're going to be the green tech capital of the world. And who's going to be the face of it? Who from our provincial government would be believable on that file right now? Am I wrong? I'm not wrong. I'm not wrong. I want to get into the chatterbox, but like, I don't even know where to, I don't even know where to start on this one, Sam. It's been, people are, I mean, there, there's a lot of uh, comments here on the tanker ban. I mean, where do we want to start? The tanker ban, I'll acknowledge it's hypocritical. Uh, we, now, it's not hypocritical if you look at unceded coastline, territory, vulnerable uh, marine life. Like, there's a, there's a whole bunch of reasons to, suge- to, to argue for a tanker ban. It, it is devastating economically. It has major implications, and it's incongruous with how we view our East Coast. No tanker ban there. So you can't, I feel like on this one, I can argue both sides, but I think you'd have a hard time pulling that ban. Now, where did you land when Senator put that in front of us? Uh, I mean, I'm, I, I don't want to just come out and brazenly say I'm for the tanker ban, but I, I do think that, you know, when we talk to marine scientists and we talk to indigenous communities in that area and we talk about, uh, the northern area of BC, this is, it's not comparable to the East Coast. I think that that is an unfair comparison based on the marine wildlife that's there, based on the communities that live there, based on the environment sen- environmentally sensitive land that some pipelines would have to cross to do ports in the northern area. Um, my fiance grew up in northern BC and she loves to tell me about when, uh, you know, oil companies would show charts of the northern Gulf Islands, and some islands were actually removed. Like, literally, they took islands off the map and said, hey, look, it's safe. We can navigate tankers through here. Um, that doesn't sit mel- well with me. And I think that there is there are areas of our coastline that we have to acknowledge are more environmentally sensitive than others, and that's what this ban is about. So, you know, just kind of scratching the surface and, and, and just... You know, learning what I have about the northern BC communities and and their massive, massive, massive distrust of these projects. I think that's something else we have to talk about is they've been lied to and gaslit over and over and over again. And they are like they're just not having it. Well, people shouldn't forget why Northern Gateway collapsed the first time. Mm -hmm. Right. People people shouldn't forget why the court said no to Northern Gateway the first time. It's because former Prime Minister Stephen Harper tried to do, in a way, I mean, i got to be careful when you start comparing actions of, of, of federal leader, you know, global leaders, you know, to compare Stephen Harper to Donald Trump. But both of them tried to flex their muscles and fast track pipelines. Right. And, and Stephen Harper tried to do it with Northern Gateway. And Donald Trump tried to a certain degree ish to do it with Keystone XL. And both of them failed for, for generally speaking, the same reasons, because governments tried to ram them through. Yeah, and and like another thing, and I think that this is something that gets a little bit lost in the weeds. And and you know, Albertans are very, 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 very frustrated when uh, legislation like C forty eight and like C sixty nine go into place because they are restrictive to the way that we can export our stuff. But you know, the flip side of that coin is. If we fight this legislation, if we don't have this, we don't have a set of rules to play by. And every single project is going to end up in court from now until the end of time if we don't have a written down set of rules on how to engage this area. So, you know, maybe the legislation isn't absolutely perfect, but it at least gives us a rule book. Um, 
I appreciate this from Dave. Dave sends me a link uh, to a Seattle Times article. They were talking about an oil tanker. Uh, there's no oil tanker storage on Puget Sound. Uh, I've not read the article. Obviously, we're live. Um, but Dave says, no disrespect to Senator Black, but we are not alone with, with tanker bans. He says both Florida and Washington State have tanker bans. Um, you know, Garnet's watching in from Saskatchewan this morning. Good morning, Saskatchewan. Good morning to you, Mr. Elmer. He says, you know, Senator, I agree with a lot of what you say, and I thank you. But frankly, you know, you easily criticize the federal government, but you're not critical of the Kenny government to the same extent. Uh, love from Saskatchewan. That from Garnet with proper Canadian politeness. Oh, I love it. Yeah. Um, not everyone. E- even even there, there's some scathing indictments of some of the opinions people have heard today uh, on our live chat. But still, relatively speaking, uh, you're behaving yourselves, which I appreciate. I'm, I'm interested to know, like, on some of the specifics, like, I, I don't, I wouldn't be surprised if there was indigenous interest in owning pipeline. They've, they've expressed, I mean, I've, I've talked to Audrey Poitras from the Métis. I've talked to a ton of people. You, you talk about, uh, I mean, Grand Chief of Treaty 6 was in our, on our first week. Billy Morin, uh, Grand Chief Morin, uh, was in talking about, I mean, there, he, the guy wants to buy the Why national. Why don't we just buy the railroad? He wants to buy the national railroad. And if you know him, if you know Grand Chief, he's not He'll joking. Do He'll do it. Yeah. <laughs> he's not joking. Um, and so so I don't doubt that there's interest, but, but to talk about, you know, I mean, even looking on the coal mining and the provincial government has has been able to bring out indigenous leaders that have said we do not object to the open pit coal mining in the in the rocky mountains um and you look at different communities you can't say um you know i, I want to be careful how i even phrase this but you cannot say canada's indigenous people think this canada's first nations think that you can't do it i mean the very <laughs> The very act of referring to them as First Nations, plural, acknowledges that they're different and of they course. have different interests all of over course. the country. You look at Treaty 6, Treaty 7, Treaty 8, there's going to be different priorities. Obviously, coastal communities are going to have very different priorities and, and probably very different. You know, you, you, you take a look at a, at a you know, an, a First Nation in Alberta that's in an, that's in a, a resource rich. Well, they're. There are resource resource riches open to perception, right? I mean, if like you have incredible fresh water and ample fish stock, that's a that's natural resource. That's a rich natural resource. So let me rephrase. But you may have an opportunity to do very well with fossil fuels, right? Uh, and and that will influence your perspective, and your perspective will differ from other First Nations or other. It doesn't have to be First Nations, other communities. You know, you talk to Larry White guy that lives in in North Vancouver uh, and he's going to have a different opinion on the tanker ban than than you're going to have living in Grand Prairie. Like it's that's just that goes without saying that's something obvious. That's real talk. So I don't doubt that you could find indigenous leaders or communities that would be very interested in 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 owning or co-owning a pipeline project. Uh, but that doesn't, to me, solve the issue that would bound to be, like you said, be tied up in the courts for years in trying to push a pipeline through. So uh, that's an interesting one. Uh, Alberta is a green tech leader. I just I was like scribbling down notes as Senator Black was was talking to punish Alberta, the, the foreign funded campaign. I just I don't quite frankly, I don't have time for it. And 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 here's the thing you're saying, Ryan, you know, you're being so dismissive. You're, just, you're so arrogant and you're so dismissive. If there was a well-organized obvious foreign funded campaign against Alberta oil, Steve Allen would not need three extensions, a million more dollars and and a whole lot of help to put a report together that would make it past a grade 10 English teacher. I mean, it's an embarrassment right now. It's a complete debacle. If you missed our conversation with Sandy Garasino yesterday, you want to check it out. And by the way, her follow up story published yesterday afternoon at nationalobserver.com is is one you're not going to want to miss. Uh, the team at St. Albert and Sherwood Dodge wants you to know that 2021 is a huge year for the Jeep lineup. I don't have the comment in front of me. Did you see the comment from Will yesterday? On the, Do you know what I'm talking about? I, I don't. He took aim at Jeeps. Oh. I don't remember the exact comment. Words. It was on. It was on the. Yeah, it was on the. It was on the chatterbox, and and so Will basically said something along the lines of, "I think he was trying to pick a fight with you, real talkers." And he said, "Oh, Jesperson, if I can paraphrase, he said your whole your whole like you know you know like pie in the sky, unicorns, zero emissions, no pipelines, you know, yay carbon tax audience." Listening to you go on and on about these gas guzzling jeeps, he said. Oh, he said like the the hypocrisy, right? He was just and and I, and I'm reading this and I'm going, gas guzzling jeeps. So I thought today, 
I'm going to take a second. Like, the 30 seconds are up. The ad's over. But I'm just getting started. Because I got to tell you, the new Grand Cherokee that I'm driving, I'm trying to decide if I can tell you something. This... No, I can't tell you. Let me just say, it keeps up. We've got the Hemi 5.7 V8. That You know the Grand Cherokee? The, the 2010, they put that out. That 5.7, it's like 400 horse and it flies. So we, we've owned that for a long time. I've got this new one. It's the V6. And when I picked it up, I'm going to be honest. This is real talk. I was like, really, guys? The V6? And then I just happened to, under safe circumstances, be able to, let's just say, put those two against one another. And let's just say the V6 does just fine. And you're going to say, Ryan, you're not you're not offering a compelling argument here in any sense about emissions or gas guzzling. All you're doing is talking about how your Jeep can fly. I want to reiterate, you should always follow the rules of the road and never break the speed limit. Here's the deal. That Jeep that's got all the power that anybody, any reasonable person needs. I can drive to Calgary like in other times when I'm visiting my family. I've driven to Calgary. I've driven out to a golf course, back to my parents' house, driven to see a friend, back to my parents' house, driven back to Edmonton on one tank of gas. So these are not gas-guzzling machines. The technology, as a matter of fact, is remarkable. And that's in the Grand Cherokee. Never mind the Compass. Never mind their smaller, more fuel-efficient grocery getters. Check out the Jeep lineup. What was that, four minutes? At St. Albert and Sherwood Dodge, they're your home for Jeep. Also wanted to mention that the team at Kubi Energy right now, we're talking about Alberta 2.0 and what that might look like. Talking about reinventing ourselves. You want to take a first step? You want to put your money where your mouth is? You want to even go so far as to try to get off the grid? The team at Kubi is Tesla certified. They employ only journeyman electricians, and they're installing solar in commercial and residential scenarios in BC and Alberta. These guys are making it happen, and they're proud to be leading the charge in Western Canada. Kubi Energy, of course, also uh, sponsors positive reflections here on the show, which means that we always get our Monday started off on the right foot. If you have a photo or a great story you want to share with us, send it to talk at ryanjesperson.com. That's presented by Kubi energy and if you want to learn more about what they're doing in solar all you have to do is check out the sponsors tab at ryanjesperson.com that'll link you to their website and you go from there we're going to be getting to a round table in just a moment but i also wanted to it's a priority you know sam and i receive so many emails from you when you do email talk at ryanjesperson.com and we want to leave some time every day if we can to get to some of these I, I, I mean it's it's remarkable how many of you are in touch with us we want you to know we read every single one we do our best to respond to as many as we can this one from kurt really jumped out at me and kurt the subject line of his email says back to basics in agriculture like with a question mark back to basics he says guys i'm a grain farmer he says, I somewhat religiously tune into Real Talk. Thanks, Kurt. He says, uh, I really appreciated your roundtable introducing some of your listeners to agriculture. He said, I, I know that, that that Ryan's given platforms to ag in the past, and for that I'm thankful. One thing that stood out to me, and I want to note, by the way, that Kurt wrote this like minutes after the roundtable wrapped. So he was he was feeling it. He was engaged. He was into the zone. He said, you read, a, you read a comment from one of your listeners that said, we need to get back to the basics in agriculture. And he said, I, I think that that ideology is actually the foundation of the biggest wall that stands between producers and consumers in agriculture today. The, the notion that ma and pa, the sort of small family farms from yesteryear, were better for the environment and produce safer food. And he said, that's, that's just simply not true. He says, agricultural techniques have advanced far beyond the plow you know, it started with general practices like no-till, which Sean Haney talked about, and it continues with science, research, innovation, uh, leading us into the future. He says, we now have genetics in canola that drastically reduce herbicide and, and do you say fungicide or fungicide? Fungicide? You say fungus. I, I say fungicide, it would be but I good. know that one kind of goes both ways. It would be a hard, I think, it, yeah, yeah, fungicide, because you say it's fungus, yeah. not fungus. Fungus you don't say fungus, no. Okay, thanks yeah. for helping me sort that out. I that's, just need that's fine. I just needed to workshop that. He said, you know, we're cutting back on fungicide use as well as resistance to certain, you know, yield robbing diseases like black leg and club root. New tech is being developed constantly, says Kurt. Constantly, like machinery that helps broad acre farms plant small seeds with the same accuracy that they've seen in the corn industry for years, allowing us to cut seeding rates in half while maintaining a one-pass seeding system. Now, us city slickers, we're, we're sort of, he's losing us a little bit here, but we can imagine one-pass seeding. They probably don't have to do it twice. Probably emissions. Am I getting that right to our farming friends? 
He says, we try to do more with less every year, like machinery that distributes fertilizer at variable rates across fields based on soil type and topography. Agriculture does not need to go back to basics. He says, what we need to do is have a conversation, an open conversation about the environment, about food safety, and we need to continue to advance. He says, and with respect to the environment, nitrogen production needs to be improved. But, you know, cow farts is what he's talking about. But as farmers, we do not have the resources to tackle this issue alone. We should be exploring the buzzword regenerative ag. Many of these practices seem good for the environment, but they take time to perfect. And in a lot of cases, they simply cannot be as profitable as conventional agriculture. These times of learning, often years, can cost an operation big dollars in lost earning potential. He says, you know, the the margins in ag are razor thin and it takes an entire year to collect one set of data. Many practices on our farm have been fine tuned over like 30 or 40 years. So to change gears and experiment with unproven practices, it can be really risky. Says it's easy for somebody to say that this is not sustainable and and, and it's my fault for not being ahead of the curve. But, But if we're truly all in this together, he says, then maybe we should be compensated by government instead of taxed carbon taxed into submission. Kurt says many jurisdictions in the world subsidize their ag industries. Um, I mean, we do too. I'm not going to interrupt his email, but we do too. Um, He says here, we're not even compensated for lost revenue due to geopolitical issues that our government has direct ties to. We're simply being forced into a corner and without incentives to experiment. We keep trying to turn a profit the best way we know how. Kurt says, I couldn't find the exact citation for this, but, but it's how I feel sometimes. He said the same group of people that use the latest smartphone technology seem to want their food produced using a horse and a plow. And for the record, he says that comment from a viewer on using solar energy to dry grain. Really? He said, solar energy is what we hope dries out our grain. But if solar doesn't get, he's talking about sunlight, but if solar doesn't get the job done in the time frame our climate gives us, we need to get that revenue off the field and into the bin. He's right. He says, Mother Nature can be a real bitch sometimes, but we have bills to pay. It might be worth noting that we only dry grain when we have adverse weather conditions like a wet, cool fall, which is really not our choice. He says, technology in ag is, is a matter of fact, incredible. And I love working in this industry every day. He says, it took me a week. uh, He says, it took me a decade working in the oil field to be able to afford to farm. But hey, I'm here now. That from Kurt. Kurt, love that you watched the show. Love that you took the time to email in. And I love that you've got us thinking. So thanks very much for that. You can send us an email anytime by visiting talk at ryanjesperson.com. This next conversation, we're just going to kick it off. And then I'm just going to let it go. Because it's a significant week right now. And this is a, when, when we ask you to reach out to us, when, when we ask you to, to, to send us, your thoughts, your segment ideas, these aren't platitudes. We really appreciate when you're in touch with us and you let us know what's what's going on in your world. For example, it would have flown under my radar. I have no problem admitting that. It would have flown under my radar that this week is Eating Disorders Awareness Week. Did you know? Well, Ashley Wanamaker reached out to us. Ashley's uh, an engaged viewer and said, Jesperson, I think that this is perfect fodder for a real talk roundtable. I said, done. So here we are today, and it's a real pleasure. I want to introduce our guests, and then then I kind of just want to hand things off because I am among those who has a lot to learn about the important discussion points here. Ashley Wanamaker is a registered psychologist and a proud real talker. Ashley, welcome to the show, and thank you so much for being here today. Thanks for having me, and I'm excited to be here to chat about this. Shannon Smith is a body image photographer, and we're going to learn more about what, what's involved with that. Shannon, welcome to Real Talk. Thanks for being here. Thank you for having me as well. And rounding out our panel today is the president of Black Lives Matter down in Calgary, Adora Nuofor. Adora, am I, am I pronouncing your surname correctly? You got it this time, Ryan. Thank okay, you. well, you got it, and welcome to Real Talk. Thank you for being here. Um, I want to encourage the three of you, as I said in the email to you earlier, to interact with one another. Feel free to interrupt, to build on what each other is saying. You don't have to wait for me to address you. Ashley, it makes sense to start with you. Uh, why did you reach out to the show? Sure, yeah. Um, I responded to a tweet that you had retweeted, um, I think, 
tongue in cheek <laughs> that someone had sent you an email commenting on your weight and saying that uh, you had looked, I think it said that you had gained some weight and are you going to address the obesity epidemic on your show? Uh, to which I responded and said, what a great opportunity to talk about the dangerous effects of fat shaming and weight discrimination during eating disorders awareness week. Um, and this isn't an uncommon tweet or comment to see, I think in our community, uh, people feel an entitlement to comment on other people's bodies or weight all the time. And so I thought it was a, a good invitation to open up this discussion more broadly. Um, Shannon, you, uh, you, you have a fascinating business. Um, you're, you're a body image photographer uh, who specializes in boudoir and portrait photography. But, but here's the thing. Um, a, a lot of photographers, I think, are celebrated for their ability. To, let me put it this way. I'll be self-deprecating because it'll cut right to the point. The image that we use of me, the headshot that we use of me on all the Real Talk branding, on the website, on my Twitter profile, a buddy of mine who also works in media in Canada reached out to me and he said, congratulations on the headshot. It doesn't even look like you. And and it, and it, and it made me laugh because A, it's, he's right. And B, that's oftentimes when we look at a great portrait photographer, it's somebody that's able to clean up our jawline and e eradicate and eliminate our blemishes and make us look like we wish we could look. But you, you work on helping your clients heal and view themselves in a new lens. Tell us about your approach to your job. Well, thank you so much, Ryan. I think that's a huge thing on uh, portrait photography is people wanting to look like that model image that is on a model, on a magazine cover. And for me, um, I typically work with cis, trans uh, women and non-binary folks. And um, for me, it is about people taking center stage in that moment and giving them the empowerment to see themselves as they are. And uh, we'll get into this, I'm sure, but most people have um, a form of body dysmorphia and being able to um, share them what they're not able to see through their own mind's eye is something that I um, treasure and I'm so blessed to do. And I don't do any of that Photoshop stuff. I don't slim jaw lines and I don't take away <laughs> pounds. That's something that um, at the very beginning of my journey, I strongly disagreed with and um, just feels icky to me inside. Um, the only things that I do are like remove blemishes and bruises. That's if it's going to be gone in two weeks, then okay. But otherwise, it stays. That's you. And that should be honored. We should be unapo un unapologetically ourselves. Adora, how do you approach, uh, when we talk about body image, I mean, it's such an enormous conversation to have. You could approach it from a thousand different angles. Uh, what do you think is, is, a, is, is, a, is a significant point that we should be focusing on as a society, most especially this week? I think that... Um body acceptance and body neutrality are very important for society at large. Like this vessel has gotten me through everything because I'm here. Like it's a hundred percent. Can't get a better rate than that. So accepting the body that you have. And um, I like to say I'm a stylist for the unique to fit because uh, we have this thing called straight sizing garbage because you know everybody needs clothes if they want um and i feel like dress the body that you're in accept the body that you're in you might be mad at it you might be bloated on a day that you want your belly to be flat you might not have enough space in your body to maybe carry a baby past a certain term um you know like heavier babies are usually healthier so the, the body does things that we don't always like, so we should accept them. And if we're upset, okay, that's that's fine. Let's work on it. Two weeks later, it might be different. It might not. Uh, and this body positivity, I mean, it's great if you are positive about your body, but if you are not, then that kind of leaves you out in the cold, um, feeling like there's no place for me to fit. And your body fits everywhere. Everybody's body is amazing and incredible, uh, whether it's strong or healthy or whatnot. Uh, 
we are here. So great batting average. I want to, I want, I'd love to put this uh, in, and Ashley, I want to bring this back to you, but I, I'd, I'd be curious to have all three of you comment on it. I already know um, as a matter of fact, it's going to be a bad example for me to say, I already know what they're saying in the comments, because for some reason we're blessed with an audience that just seems to be wonderful and objective and supportive. So um, I don't want to sound disappointed about that. Um, but I guarantee on more on more hostile messaging boards, people would be listening to what Adora is talking about with regards to body positivity. You already know where this is going. And they'd be saying, ah, oh, that's it's apologetics. That's all it is. You're making excuses. You're lazy. That's all you're, you're just you're, right. You're all nodding. You've all heard it before. You've all seen it before. <laughs> Ashley, how would you respond to it? Oh, where do I start? I have so many thoughts on this. Um, so, I mean, the starting point is body positivity and the body positivity movement isn't about um, enabling people to be unhealthy. It isn't about um, people just being lazy, which, by the way, uh, I have a problem with that term in and of itself. Laziness doesn't exist. Um, it's not a personality trait. And we are humans who do things for a reason all the time. We don't randomly just not do things. We don't randomly do things. There's always a reason why we do things. So if someone for whatever reason is not doing something that they'd like to be doing, um, there's a reason behind that. It's not just like, well, you're lazy. So um, the other thing is research says that shaming people, which is what that sentiment is doing, doesn't work. So we don't shame people into treating their bodies better. We don't shame people into loving themselves. Shame is actually associated with more negative outcomes, including more binge eating, more rates of suicide, more self-harm, more substance abuse. Um, so these are not outcomes that help support treating our bodies well, moving in a way that feels joyful, nourishing our bodies. Um, but the body positivity movement, which I think is a very important movement, um, I think is a great starting point to go, my body can look different than this ideal that's being perpetuated and I can still find beauty in that and I can feel beautiful. But I love that Adora brought up body neutrality, which I think in, in my opinion is sort of the next level, which is, you know, it doesn't really matter what my body looks like because the purpose of my body is to carry me through this life. So rather than what does my body look like, which is actually based on others' experiences of our body. We don't typically stare in a mirror all day experiencing what we look like. Let's shift to what does my body feel like? What does living feel like? What are my experiences? Because otherwise we miss all of those things. I, I should point out that that viewers uh, like Michelle and Skier Guy 99 are pointing out, Sam, can we take the wide shot of Ashley? Th this uh, riots, not diets behind you. Everybody's losing their minds over. <laughs> is that cross stitch? What is that? Oh, oh yeah. Uh, so this is a very poorly made cross stitch uh, that I made in grad school. Uh, I can't explain to you why it just spoke to me. So it's lived in every office that I've had since. What does it mean um, to you? Um, well, <laughs> it means that instead of engaging in, you know, reinforcing diet culture and um, all the dangers that come with that to let's protest it. I think that uh, one treatment strategy that I think is really effective is bringing politics into how we treat our bodies. And so uh, personally, in my own experience, you know, being the size that, that I am naturally not trying to change my body, not trying to meet a certain ideal uh, feels political to me. I think it's a political statement to say, this is who I am. I don't need to apologize for it. I don't need to adhere to an idea um, that's been, you know, forced upon me. Um, I think that in and of itself is a political statement. So that's what it means. It's also a fun thing to encourage other people to use as a mantra as we work through treatment that uh, sometimes getting angry can be one of the most healing things. Uh, particularly for women when we're talking about body image. Well, I guarantee you people are writing it down. People aren't going to forget it. The, the audience is responding strongly to it. Uh, Shannon, to refocus, um, to bring it back to, to you know, body positivity or, or body neutrality, what would you say to the critics? Every, everybody's got a voice these days. Everybody's got an opinion, and, and, and they voice them loudly. Yes. First, I have to say, I almost wore my Riots Not Diets tank top today, and I <laughs> laughed when I saw um, Ashley um, before we started, because I was like, that would have been really funny. Um, <laughs> so, um, going towards, um, like, 
all of the like, oh, you're not healthy and you know, you're just being apathetic. And obviously it's, I can't hide it. I'm a plus size woman, so um, I'll probably get it. But um, <laughs> um, I, I'm not apathetic to who I am. I grew up with genes and DNA of settlers that were larger and um, my entire family are larger people larger people for the most part. And um, I can't change that. I can't change my DNA. I can't wake up tomorrow and have Beyonce's DNA. Like as much as I would like to wake up tomorrow with Queen B um, aesthetic, like that's not me. It's not going to happen. I would take and, Beyonce's um, DNA. <laughs> I mean, why not, right? <laughs> um, so she's my inner heroine. And um, so I have like I have been shamed since the time that I was young. Um, I remember at age nine wanting to cut off my stomach because maybe people would like me about more in school. And um, if we think about, I have a young son and he's five. And I think at nine, if he was thinking those thoughts, like I would be, I, I would feel terrible. And um, that doesn't go away. Even as adults, we still have our own bodies and our own life experiences that offer us this vessel, what I call a meat suit, to go from point A to point B and experience the human journey. And if that means, like Adara said, um, if I am one day feeling positive about it and I'm like, oh yeah, I'm looking fine and you know all of those things, that's great. But that doesn't mean I'm gonna stay there. And often when we go from this place of like high positivity, we go to this place that's like low negative because everything goes in balance, right? So if we shift too much to the right, we go too much to the left. And so body neutrality is great because it's in that center area where if we're feeling great, awesome, that's a bonus. If we're feeling you know, not so good, then it's not gonna last there. We know that we can take ourselves out of that. So when we talk about like health as a factor, first off, I recommend everyone who doesn't, who's being enlightened to this today to check out um, Healthy at Every Size or Body Respect by Linda Bacon, because that is like the holy grail. She's a science um, uh, researcher on this subject because it is poorly funded. We have fat bias in our society and in our medical fields. And um, so anyways, as a fat bodied person myself and someone who advocates for fat bodies and for all people is that um, health is not a significant factor to my worth as a person. I can, I am worthy, it doesn't, my body doesn't tell you how great of hugs I am and how great a person I have, what I've achieved, the people I've helped, the accomplishments that I've done as a person, it literally just tells you this is my body. So great if you wanna, you know, judge a book by its cover type thing, but you're not gonna get very far if that's if you're a judgmental person quite frankly and that's not just to be rude shannon i think that some people that are watching this or listening to the podcast will be surprised to hear you using the word fat yes like can we like okay so this is huge for me and thank you i'm so used to using the word i'm fat like if i reclaim this word you can't harm me with it you can't say you're fat and i'll go yeah so what like, ooh, good, you have eyes. Like, <laughs> there's really not much more you can say to hurt me. And this goes in other communities, Black community, um, in queer community. Like, we're all reclaiming these words that have been like daggers to us for so long that we're like, no, I take my power back and you can't hurt me. You can't harm me with these words. And if I use it in my everyday language, then that allows other people to hear the word she used that fat and like that she didn't she didn't die you know and she didn't crawl into a crawl, uh, like fetal position so i think that's really wonderful if we can continue using it and and the the proper term is to say fat bodied because overweight they're over what weight the bmi chart mm -hmm. is bullshit are and you <laughs> hang on a second are you are you saying that 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 Jen, i know adora is like just waiting to get in here so yes, i promise yes, I, yes. I, she's she's like bouncing, she's like when are you gonna t let me talk but i but so really like that's that's as as the as as um you know okay so i always quote the big lebowski but the preferred nomenclature is actually fat bodied like like people can say fat bodied i think that's going to be uh, that would be news to a lot of people yeah, if if Ashley was come up to me and be like, "How is life in a fat body?" There's there's no negativity of that, and she's asking a genuine question. She's not saying, "Shannon, you're in a fat body, and how does this determine your health?" Like. 
that's a different connotation and I just right. won't have that dialogue, right? But if she's too, I acknowledge that Ashley, first I'm picking on you, but I acknowledge that Ashley is in a thin body and that is okay. Or a straight size body is what we can also call that. I can acknowledge that Adara is in a black body and that is honored and appreciated too, because as we all know, removing those blocks allows us to see all of us as unique, beautiful people, which we all are. Okay, I have to. I'm going to hand the mic over, but I, I have to apologize. Yes. Is it is it Adara or Adora? Adora. It say is. It, oh, no, 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 no. I'm no. I don't want to. No, I just want to. I want to make sure that, that that we say it correctly. So that's that's all. So now we move on. So Adora, I'm just going to hand the mic over to you. I you you don't need a question. <laughs> like Shannon, Ashley, you said so much great stuff. I will now be saying riots, not diets, and. <laughs> That, that's going to mean a whole lot for me as president of Black Lives Matter, what it might be. But um, I use Pat to identify myself to, as an adjective about my body all the time. And a lot of people will say, no, you're not fat. You look good. And I'll be like, you can be both. I can be fat and look good. And here's the thing about my body is I'm very tall. So it fits into the narrative of this is a positive size body, but it's actually fat. Like I'm a 16, I'm an 18, sometimes I'm a 20. <laughs> and I have also been in a thin body. That's how I found out that I can be the same person regardless. So fat is a size. That, that is all. And let's, just like tall is a size. And a lot of people assume that tall is a good size. Some days it is, sometimes it's not. But I use the word all the time. So Shannon, thank you for saying that. And uh, fat bias. Ooh, for sure. Like Shannon said, Adora's in a black body and that's political. So add fat, that's political. Add tall, that's political. So before I do or say anything, people have already decided what they think about me as a person who exists um, and then will treat me a specific kind of way. And uh, I also want to say that Queen Bee, like her body was not the body in the 80s. That was not a positive body. I know because that's the body I had. And lots of people told me I was fat mm -hmm. or my bum was too big mm -hmm. or, you know, I didn't have enough breath, whatever it was. A lot of people wanted to judge me based on my body. They also hypersexualized my body. So a lot of fat bodies are not seen as sexually um, uh, attractive, which is not true. Every body somebody is attracted to and be attracted to yourself. Like that's okay. Also be a sexual subject. So important. But within the black community, you very often hear terminology like thick to take the sting off of fat, which is fine. But fat is not bad. Um, recently, uh, Tracy Moore from Sitter Line posted on her Instagram and said, Caribbean people, I know it's all kinds of people, but Tracy Moore said, Caribbean people, you get fat isn't a greeting. <laughs> and my response to that was, yes, I'm fat, thank you. Because I, like Shannon Ashley, trying to change that narrative. Now I'm a model and when I show up old, fat and black, I call it triple threat. <laughs> and very often people want to like lighten me or you know, take away that role. Sometimes I'll see the role and I'll be like, oh, I didn't know that that was there, but you know what? It's there and it's good. Let it stay. Let it be there. Cause that's how I exist. And you know, Sometimes I don't exist with a flat stomach and I don't owe anybody that, including myself. So, like, I think that this is a fantastic conversation. And anyone, anytime somebody starts telling me about my health and the way my body looks, quite frankly, I have been very unhealthy and looked the bomb. Oh, for sure. Um, I mean, like, and, and I'm not talking about you, Adora. I'm just saying, generally speaking, you know, we, we look at, you know, we, we want to talk about eating disorder awareness week. I mean, you know, people, you know, one person in particular, very close to me, uh, struggled with bulimia for many years. Um, if I can say she looked fabulous uh, and was horribly unhealthy. 
um, and her mental health is is at a very positive point right now. Um, can I just say, just to maybe point out the obvious, that one of the most amazing um, elements of a roundtable or a panel conversation is when there's a mix of like you know professional expertise and perspectives, but also the personal journeys on display. And I'm so grateful that the three of you are talking about your personal journeys because people are going to be there's going to be people that are watching this or listening to this later on that are not to a point where they can walk in a room and say, "Yeah, I am fat body and I'm confident as hell." And if you don't like it, you, that, that's just frankly not where they're at some people would love to be there i'm sure we're talking about different demographics and i I wanted to read a couple of comments here this is interesting i want to talk about gender um and i someone someone has like a speaker or something on i don't know if we can address that or shut that speaker down i'm hearing an echo in my ear sam i don't know if we can do anything on our end maybe not um but 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 let's talk gender first um and then and then i'll ask you to extrapolate whether we you know um shannon you talked about lgbtq2s plus community we uh, adora you've, you mentioned the black community um you know patrick writes in and he says this round table is absolutely awesome um helping men with body image issues is one of the goals of the charity calendar I put together. And I see that Patrick, um, you can look him up on Twitter at BCom Patrick Gene. His, his Facebook page is called, it's not a dad bod. It's a father figure and he's raising money. He's done a dad bod calendar. Meantime, Shalane is watching and on our, uh, chat room, uh, uh, on our live chat, she says, raising a daughter in a body positive society is such a challenge but panel conversations like this are so awesome and so important. Ashley, is there is there a, a gender consideration or a gender element to be discussed here? Are, are women or men typically more insecure? I think I might know the answer, but I don't assume. Yeah, I think it's a great question. I mean, before we talk about sort of statistics around that, uh, it's important to know that the statistics on eating disorders are probably wildly lower than they actually are because most people... Um, don't receive a proper diagnosis, and most people don't have access to treatment. So historically speaking, there was a long period of time where eating disorders were thought of as this sort of like rich, white, straight girl thing. Um, We know that that's not true. We know that that's the demographic that had access to treatment most of the time for lots of reasons. Um, Men are absolutely affected by eating disorders as well. We see, and we see distinctions in how that manifests in um, for example, gay men versus straight men, what that looks like tends to be different. Um, but, but trans adolescents actually are at the highest risk. Um, and this is a population that I feel really strongly about because a lot of the standardized eating disorder treatment, which is very limited anyway, um, doesn't address the experience of trans kids. Um, they're four times more likely to have an eating disorder. They're disproportionately more likely to have any mental illness, um, than their peers, their straight peers. So, um, or cisgendered peers. So they, they are at very high risk. Uh, men, I think in the last few years, we're starting to see more and more awareness. Um, but I think, again, because we tend to socialize straight men as saying, you know, you're socially allowed to feel anger or be stoic. We don't exactly invite an easy path to treatment to say, hey, I'm not doing okay. This is what's going on internally for me. Here are my emotions. Here's how I'm taking it out of myself which I guess I just want to add to this. Uh, Adora touched on this as well, but um, talking about body image, and maybe we'll circle back to this, but body image is actually not based on any external measures. This is why we can have like a really great body image day. And then the next day we'll be like, I feel like a monster today. It's not because we you know, gained or lost an insane amount of weight overnight. It's because that our beliefs, our attitudes, our experiences in our body shape our body image. And that's constantly evolving. So when someone, you know, comes to my office and is like, I'm, I, I hate my body image. I don't feel good about myself. I'm always curious to get underneath that and say, what's going on emotionally? What is your experience in your body? What have you been taught about your body? And let's work on that because eating disorders, body image, it's not really about food or weight or body shape or size. It's about something so much deeper that usually goes back to trauma. Um, so that was a rant. <laughs> no, you're, this, yes. this show is, the show is rant friendly. Um, right. <laughs> Shannon, you've, you've talked about, you know, you, you, you specified that you work, you said you work with cis uh, women, uh, trans women and non-binary folks in your bio you told me of all ages shapes sizes races and lgbtq2s plus members um do, do you pick up on 
trends there or is, or is there is there an angle there in, in the context of demographics that that might help some people sort out how they're feeling? And by the way, on a side note, what's going on in our live chat right now is remarkable. People are people are like confronting something. Can I can I read a comment here? I mean, let me let, here's just one. Just just I'll pick one like James. Um, James says, I've definitely had medical professionals treat me poorly due to my size. Um, he says it's usually the exception. But still, if anybody should understand, it would be doctors or nurses. Uh, what about this from from a viewer that says, I totally disagree that every body is beautiful. I feel that my body is ugly. My posture is bad. I'm short. I'm going gray at 37. I wish I could be taller. I mean, I'm jealous of people who are 5'9". I mean, people are putting this out there publicly right now. The three of you are having a real impact on people. That's like that's such an honor, I think. I think the three of us can can say that unanimously is having this dialogue and having people be vulnerable about their body is is tremendous. And for me, um, none of this, I'm sure to you, Ryan, it's shocking and it's alarming and, and good and 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 everything. But I I've done this for four and a half years, so it doesn't really shock me. <laughs> and it's and 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 that's not a bad thing. It's just I it always brings me back to the beginning when someone it does say, you know what? Um, a medical professional didn't treat me properly. Well, ask them to put that in your file and advocate for yourself as a fat body person. You have to, if, um, if I go in because I have a broken arm and they want to tell me to lose 20 pounds, that will help my broken arm. Like that's not okay. So write that down. Um, if somebody is saying, no, I just, I see myself as ugly and, and everyone else can be beautiful and I'm ugly. I think it's really important to tap on what Ashley said, because um, it's true. Our, our, we are, oh my gosh, I have like, my brain is flooded with all the things, right? Now. <laughs> um, we as women, and this, I specifically don't typically work with sit het men. It's not because you're unworthy of help. Um, my own trauma just doesn't allow me to feel completely at home and safe to work in that environment. But um, we as women-centered beings specifically are taught that we must only eat 1,200 calories, which is the equivalent of what a toddler should eat, um, that we um, must have this certain figure for the male gaze, typically, stereotypically for male gazes, and that um, our entire being is about um, getting the admiration of men rather than completing our own goals. And then as we move on in the timeline, as we get into older females, then what happens is, is that um, we now become invisible. And because we're no more, we're, we're, we're taken out of the like sexual peak people and the ideal body people. And now like, well, what do you have to offer? And so what happens is that the gray hair and the like baby rolls and all those things that, um, that, we, that we get from possibly having babies, if that was a decision and, and it's something your body could give you, um, you become this invisible person and society. Um, I mean, we can look at the Hollywood demographic. If you see an older woman, um, she has probably had plastic surgery. She has been taken away, not given many roles unless you're Meryl Streep. And, um, so it's, it's reclaiming that this is political. I am a feminist. I, I'll say that straight out. So, um, with that, that means that, I believe that if we are starving our bodies and our brains, this keeps us pliable for male agendas and it keeps us not able to accomplish what we're here on this earth to do. So instead of dealing with emotions, okay, now this is going back to Ashley, instead of dealing with emotions, we have these like four large emotions and then a demographic of emotions underneath. And we're not taught in any manner in school or anything how to deal with that unless you've had professional help by people like Ashley who are amazing um, and will teach you this um, we just decide to take emotions out on our bodies and past generations have taught us this and this bias this generational cycle that happens when there was less education on health for every body um, is that we continually, instead of like dealing with the pandemic feels or dealing with my shitty day at work or whatever, is that we take it out on our body. It is the thing we can touch, it's tangible and I can't touch my emotions. Like I just can't. And so when Ashley's saying, I want to know what 
foundations you've had. Foundation of body image is from two to nine years old. So what happened in that time frame in your life? Was there childhood trauma? Did somebody say something that is close to you that has left an imprint? We have to deal with that. We have to deal with the emotions of the day. Like there's, this is such a big like topic. <laughs> and then we have societal that idolations are like, you must diet because that will make you belong and feel loved and you'll have that societal body. And like, can you notice that we can go for hours about that? Shannon? Well, I just, I just, I just want to, Shannon, I want to, I want to like spell it out that you, you just need to stop worrying about time uh, because it, we don't, we, we I'll get to the commercial break. When we get to a commercial break, the show will end when the show ends. I mean, if there's still, ten, if, if there's still 10 people watching, we can keep talking. So don't worry about it. Okay. There's no rules. This is, you know, we can say, fuck, we can do whatever we want. Okay. This is, we're not owned by a big billion dollar corporation. We don't have people hovering over our shoulders. Older. There's no time limit, so rant on. It's no problem. Um, Adora, I want to come to you in a second, but I just want to fact check something because we do have a registered psychologist in the house, and, I, and, and something just really jumped out at me, what Shannon said. So, Ashley, is it true? Is the foundation for body image age two to nine? I mean, that, that to me, I'm perceiving that in a number of ways. Number one, that a two-year-old is picking up on on that, and, and, and I hope not to be the pessimist here, but that it's all said and I mean, not all said and done, but... But by nine, you've already got kind of the view complete. I mean, is that accurate? Yes. Uh, and I'm going to say something that's probably going to be more upsetting, which is we're seeing the, the age of um, where eating disorder onset is happening younger and younger. There, there are kids as, as old as six years old who are getting hospitalized for eating disorders. We've seen, you know, access for treatment, especially during the pandemic, which I think we should talk about too, um, you know, triple. And there isn't enough support. So what I will say is that from a trauma-informed perspective, which is what I operate from, uh, this idea that our brain is in a stage, usually around age four or five or six, where we're really um, developing beliefs around, okay, what is the world? Who am I? And how do those things interact? So something you know, as simple as if I'm five, and maybe this can help clarify what we mean when we say trauma, because I think a lot of people think about, you know, trauma as like these capital T traumas, like war or murder or like these big events. But trauma informed theory talks about that. Probably most of us have some trauma and, and some, most of us do also have capital T trauma, but all of us have lowercase T trauma. And that really looks at whenever something happens in our life and it can be, you know, on the surface, kind of boring, but something happens in our life where our belief about the world or ourself or how that interacts is changed and our nervous system has to adjust to accommodate that. So we have these beliefs that around age, you know, four, five or six. So if I'm, and this is a fictional, you know, anecdote here, but if I'm like five and I'm at a birthday party and I see my brother get a bigger piece of cake than me in that moment, and then I'm sad, I might learn oh, I am less valuable than my brother. And maybe my parent says, don't cry. And then I go, oh, and this emotion I'm feeling is unacceptable. And of course, like on the surface, people are at a birthday party eating cake. It's like, it doesn't look like there's anything wrong. But what I might be internalizing in that moment is I'm not good enough. I am not valuable. And so that kind of sets this foundation to go, okay, so this, this belief is going to kind of run the show because this is what I'm learning of how I fit into the world. And so maybe that manifests later as, perfectionism because if I believe that I am different and I'm not good enough maybe the rules are different for me maybe I have to be thinner maybe I have to be more high achieving maybe I have to be nicer or prettier or whatever fill in the blank um which eventually you know we can kind of do that for a few decades but what happens is all those emotions that we haven't processed which get stored physically in our body kind of start to overflow and then that's where we see you know behaviors to numb those things which can show up as an eating disorder which, by the way, not eating is also emotional eating. So restricting is also emotionally eating. Mm. Um, we can see that in form of addiction or, you know, shopping or sex or drinking. Uh, you know, pick your pick your symptom to try and numb what we're feeling because we don't know what to do with it. Adora, listen, listen to some of these comments. Um, I'll, I'll get you to respond to them or you can take it in whatever direction you like. I feel like I haven't talked to you for 10 minutes. Um but this is, and that's not a swipe at the other panelists. I'm just saying we've <laughs> we got a lot of ground to cover here. Um, Jennifer, I want to read these it, it, just in the context of, of age. Uh, Jennifer says, when my stepson was four, he didn't want to wear a winter coat because he said it made him look fat. 
And at the time, his birth mom was trying to lose baby weight. Uh, What about this? Mark says, my six-year-old boy told me he wants to get a weight set. And I have no idea where that came from. Lynn says, my nine-year-old niece told me if you eat with a mirror in front of your plate, it will feel like you're eating more food and you'll get full faster. NT says, at the age of eight, I was told by a phys ed teacher I was fat. And now I'm over 50 and I'm still dealing with the effects of an eating disorder on my life. I mean, these are firsthand stories, Adora. Yeah, that's, I mean, it's happening all over. To all kinds of people, and um, I very often like to say that uh, anti-blackness is the basis, the foundation of all oppression. So this fat phobia is really about anti-blackness. Um, so if, if we understand that we have a hierarchy in the world of what's good and what's bad, and that is placed on how people's bodies exist, not on what they're doing, then we understand that it's garbage. <laughs> BS, like we've said many times before. Uh, but I'm a parent, um, and I'm 45. So very often, the, the world knows now. So um, <laughs> there, I, I say hashtag old is a privilege mm. because I did not necessarily know that this body was going to make it this small mm. because I had many problems. I had trauma. And I had issues with my my uterus, and you know, doctors weren't paying attention, but all of that informs me on how to try and teach my children. So uh, when my son was about three years old, I stopped going to church. So many reasons, but one of the reasons was that consistently they were calling me fat. And my son would be looking at me and being like, what's that? Like, what's wrong with that? Why I love my mommy, but these, he's getting the messaging from the people, um, body or you know the words that they're saying how they're responding to me that it's it's not positive like this fat is not a good thing and I didn't want my child to think that about me because I knew I had believed that about me and it harmed me. and um so eight years later I had uh twin because um, <laughs> um oh I forgot what I was gonna say <laughs> That's okay. There, we keep it real. Let me let me let me read. Actually, I feel kind of strange. I'm like laughing, and then I roll in hot to to our chatterbox where the comments and they're they're deadly serious. Um, it, it's actually heart like I'm feeling encouraged and I'm feeling heartbroken, but I but it's reiterating to me the importance of the conversation we're having. Um, you know, Megan says my grandma called me fat when I wore a bulky winter coat when I was seven. You know, she was like four foot ten and and a former fashion designer who weighed like 90 pounds. You know, that's so dangerous. Um, You know, Penny says my daughter started starving herself in grade two. We had to take her to the doctor. She she always trusted doctors. Allison says when I was nine, I cried to my mom because my thighs spread out when I sat down. Um, You know, I I was going to say, I wish we, we wish we could talk to these kids when they're kids. Now they're adults. But here we all are in conversation. Um, I feel like we're in communion together. Um, Ashley, what, I mean, you know, I mean, I would say, what do we say to these people? But that, like asking a registered psychologist to provide sort of a one-off bit of advice for everybody is a bit of a fool's errand, but how do you process yeah, what mean, you what hear? Would, yeah. What I would, I mean, it's not surprising to me. I hear this all the time, um, which is, it, it breaks my heart. Um, you know, I've been really transparent in my practice that the reason I am a psychologist is because of, of my own experience with an eating disorder that almost killed me. Um, I had trained to do an entirely different career for most of my life. And uh, it wasn't until I, you know, went to second or treatment a second time that I, you know, got really angry at the treatments that existed. And so I went back to school and out of spite, made it through a decade of school. <laughs> but uh, so I, I mean, I have my own memories of of, you know, kindergarten age, having, having these, you know, this awareness of I need to exercise. So I'm not too big. I also was like five foot nine in sixth grade. So I totally feel the pain of being, and I was a ballerina. So, you know, you want to feel like Godzilla, be like a five foot nine, 12 year old, and then go on point shoes. Like you are twice as tall as everyone. So this, the, the important thing here is that bullying and, and fat shaming and making these comments during these critical points when, when kids are forming their, 
you know, representation of the world and who they are, that is one of the number one risk factors to actually developing an eating disorder. So being, um, quote unquote, and I'm going to put this in air quotes because we'll probably talk about BMI again and why it's nonsense, but overweight um, or, or obese is actually a risk factor to develop an eating disorder later. And it's because of bullying and victimization um, through fat shaming. So what I would say to people as they're looking uh, at, you know, the little ones around them who are developing and growing is to A, create space that whatever your, your child or your loved one is feeling as a small little one, the best thing I think we can do as adults is to say, whatever you feel, whatever you think, you're safe to tell me. Um, so if you're angry, that's okay. You're angry. What, what does that anger feel like? If you're sad. What is that? What is that? feel like for you if you're worried if we can create a safe space for kids to feel and express themselves then we can have these conversations and the other thing that parents like to hear less is you have to do your own work so you know you can tell your kids every day all day that they're beautiful they're wonderful they're amazing but if you're you know engaging in diet culture and you're making comments about having to like work off your food or to earn your food or you know, we need to stop, we need to stop moralizing food for sure. This idea that there's objectively good and bad food is ridiculous. Like I have a friend who as a child ate like nine apples in one sitting and had to go to the hospital. Um, and that doesn't mean apples are evil. That doesn't mean apples are, you know, immoral. It means, yeah, too much of anything can cause problems, but we need to stop uh, talking about bad and good food. Cause then when we eat a bad food, uh, then we inherently feel like we're bad and then we have to you know and then and then we're so bad so we're like instead of eating one cookie and actually enjoying it we're like well I'm already here I'm already bad I'm so terrible I'm gonna go down a shame spiral and eat like three boxes of cookies and then I need to redeem myself by eating clean so I'm gonna only eat kale now for the future and now I'm good and I'm pure and I'm clean and then I'm gonna inevitably eat like a cookie again at some point and the cycle starts all over again so do your own work be mindful of the language you're using be mindful of what you're doing around people you love and, and one of the ways is like, stop talking about bodies, like, like stop talking about other people's bodies, stop talking or be mindful about how you're talking about your body. But even when we're telling people, you look so good, or you're so beautiful, which we tell little girls, particularly all the time, what we're teaching them is your appearance is the most important thing about you. Yeah. Your appearance is how you get attention and love. And that's how you fit into the world, which is incredibly prob- problematic. Which is, I'm, I'm so grateful to have Shannon's perspective here, too, as, a, as an image creator, right? As a photographer, an image capturer. Um, you know, we, we've got a lot of people talking about social media here and asking, you know, they're submitting questions for the panel. I want to put that to you, Shannon. Um, you know, people are asking if, if anybody here has seen the the, the Reddit, the, the I guess it's Instagram reality, the sub, subreddit Instagram reality. I don't know if you've seen it. Um, some people have asked the, the question, generally speaking, do you, do you think that Instagram is inherently bad? Um, sort of social media, the, the, the tweaks and the edits and the, the unrealistic images that are portrayed. Shannon, what do you think? I think this is a great question. Um, going alongside what Ashley said and, and incorporating this Instagram is that what we see um, is what we can represent ourselves to. So if I go back to like little Shannon, there was no fat people on TV. The people that were fat on TV were people such as Roseanne Barr, which maybe is not a good representation for fat people, just saying. Um, So the representation that was out there as a fat person or a fat child were um, fat people making fun of themselves, putting them down um, and of like just not good substance, but the nice thing about social media, whatever platform you're on, is that there is great people out there to follow. You can curate your feed to however you desire. So I um, I have like a blog of a list of people that, to start off with. <laughs> Not to plug myself, but you can like there's there's resources for that. But like if there's somebody, if you read something and you instantly feel shame, like whether it be friend, family, celebrity, whatever unfollow you do not deserve that you deserve so much more when I go to my social media it should be something that inspires me it should be something that um is a diverse um a curation so I want to see all bodies I want to see fat bodies I want to see black bodies I want to see indigenous bodies I want to see like give me all the bodies 
And then somewhere in there, I realized I fit in there and that's okay. And that's something that my mentor started um, a body pledge and um, I pledged through, because being accountable is important to me. And I pledged to show um, at least a minimum 30% of my um, website and my social media has to be diverse bodies. And I will, I, I believe that I go much, much higher than that um, because my base is typically people who are of different bodies. So I think that when we look at our social media or we're looking at people to follow, it, we should feel inherently good after we have, um, after we have view them. And that um, the more bodies and the more people that that feel the courage, and I'll talk about that in a second, um, the courage to put themselves out there in a world where um, where I can be fat shamed and I could be ridiculed, and and um, and that is something that does take courage in a way. However, going back to my point, is that saying somebody who puts their photo out there and is authentically being themselves, which is what courage is it's showing up authentically is who you are and who you want to be it it isn't courage courage is not a compliment like don't do that especially with fat people because if like for me if I'm doing like a boudoir shoot and I'm showing it and I show you know Ashley and then they're all like oh she's amazing and she's beautiful and she's sexy and blah 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 and then I show a fat body person and they're like oh that's so courageous you showed your body right. it's like uh I am beautiful as well yeah. and you know, mm-hmm. and then if I show someone who is um black condition indigenous or person of color then I want them to have that feeling as well not a oh you're courageous for showing up as you no you deserve to have that spotlight we're all amazing we're all beautiful like let's like let's do those compliments and then squaring back to what Ashley said (laughs) is that don't comment on people's bodies like just don't there's certain situations where like I may put out a photo and even for me when I put out a photo in my like group or on social media I try and share that person's journey because that's important and then we're not comparing uh, comparing our bodies to that body we're comparing journeys and if we can relate to them but don't tell little girls oh like you want to be a princess like, no, if you're going to be a princess, what are you going to do for the world? What are you going to do with your power? Like, let's like dive in further than like, oh, that's great that you look like. Yeah. In other words, we should stop being whatever. surprised when a, when a, when a, you know, a candidate or a, or a contestant at Miss Universe actually has a good answer. Uh, we shouldn't yeah. we shouldn't be surprised that she was able to put a sentence together. Susan on Twitter says, I'm absolutely loving this body image conversation, says right after. Um, I don't think it's a hint. She's saying as soon as it wraps, I don't think that's a hint. I don't think Susan's in a hurry. She says, but I am just about to go meet with three of my friends to go walking and I'm going to pass this conversation on to them. I am spreading the word that from Susan Adora, somebody earlier. In the, joy. Uh, yeah. Joy. Well, sure. And somebody earlier in the show, Adora just said to me, um, and, and I don't, I've, I've lost the tweet now, but they said something along the lines of, I hope you realize who you have here with Adora. They said, she's a yes. big deal in the activism community. And obviously, Obviously, I mean, you, you know, you were kind enough to provide me with a bio and we could re- your, your community involvement is remarkable. And I mean, you, you do a ton um, in the communities that you care about. As mentioned, you're the president of, of Black Lives Matter in Calgary. You're, you're a board director for the Nigerian Association, Kerry West, um, Fem Wave, Calgary's Feminist Music and Arts Festival. You've done a ton of stuff. March for Women. Uh, you know, you've, you've emceed events for the city. You get the idea. We, we, we know you're a big deal. And so people are going to look to you as... And some people are going to cringe at, the, at, the, at me invoking the word influencer, but you have influence over people. And so people are going to be paying attention to this conversation and they're going to be feeling inspired, but they don't maybe quite know where to channel it or what to do about it. So we always want to have a call to action, Adora. So what is it today? Yeah, the call to action, like off the top of my head, is like love yourself and grow because nobody is perfect. Nobody starts perfect. There's no baby that starts walking or running first time. Everybody falls. Um, We all need to grow. We all have big T trauma. We all have little T trauma. So know that as you exist, just as you exist, it's great. And there are things that are on the outside that are going to influence us. 
So think about those things that are influencing you, whether it's how somebody spoke to you, whether it's what you saw, what, what you see on a regular basis. Uh, take a moment to think about, hmm, is this good or bad? And you don't have to figure it out right, like right after the show is done. <laughs> you can spend your whole life figuring it out. And the more you grow, the better you'll feel. So, you know, as I said previously, I'm 45. I know that when I go out into the world, the way that I look is political. Um, so sometimes people will see me in this light and be like, oh, she's thin. And then I go out to the world and they're like, oh, well, she has a belly and she has a bum and, you know, it's moving. When when I do comedy, for sure, that bum is still moving. Um, and I just accept it. I'm unapologetic about it. It took me a very long time. I did all the things that they saw from this panel. I, I threw up to maintain my weight. I wasn't eating. I, you know, did the tease and the when I was very young and as I got older, I was like, Oh, the way that I looked five years ago was fantastic. And the way I looked 10 years ago was fantastic. And now I get to say to myself, the way you look now is fantastic. Yesterday I was bloated. That was not, you know, the place that I wanted to be, whatever. Today is the new day. I, I don't even know if I'm bloated, but I actually wanted to talk about the patriarchy also because, you know, sometimes, women are doing these things to keep our bodies safe mm. because we are hypersexualized or because we are treated better when we are cute out and not rather than not cute. Um, so it's, it's for safety. Uh, even though all types of bodies are abused, uh, you know, through sexual harassment, et cetera, et cetera. Patriarchy has really set up these standards, this hierarchy. Um, so that's why it's, a little more difficult for men to have the conversation or people who identify as men or males, they're not having this conversation because it's other men that are really perpetrating this and can make that change. So I would say men, the things that you like, do not be ashamed. Do not be ashamed. If you like a trans woman, love a trans woman. Cause that's what you like. If you like a big belly, love a big stretch mark. We have artists who are like, give me something real, like mm. that shake, like those stretch marks. If you gained weight during the pandemic, you did it so your body could continue to move and mm. live. So let's stop shaming ourselves. I know it's difficult because guilt is something that we use to moderate ourselves. But really guilt just means you're punishing yourself when you know somebody else is not going to punish you. So hold yourself truly accountable. You don't have to deal with guilt. You can apply this to so many other places in your life too. But I just feel like if we separate what we think is valuable from our worth in the world, we can have a whole new narrative on so many things. Um, I'm going to talk about people who are skinny and experiencing this sort of... Um, difficulty with body dysmorphia because it's not just fat bodies that want to change there are skinny people who want to change also people who want bigger breasts people who want more bum this and you know there's so many industries in our capitalistic society that are toxic and that will it will harm your body in the long run it doesn't mean you shouldn't do these it means that you should be very well educated before you jump into that. Go and talk to Ashley. <laughs> Go and have a little chit chat with Ashley and find out, oh, is my head where it needs to be um, before I make these changes? For instance, I change my hair. I could change my hair right now if I wanted to. We don't have time for that explosion of the brain <laughs> um, for your viewers. But I could change my hair at any time. I'm a makeup artist. I can change. I did these things because. I was trying to figure out what person I liked on the exterior and I, I love all of them. And Ashley, when you said that you were five, nine at 12, who that's for real, because I was five, seven. And I thought that was cute, <laughs> but I was a ballerina. It was for sure. It was my first love. And I was a gymnast. 
Mm -hmm. they just kept making those uneven bars wider and wider and wider and my legs were opening and they're just one day were just too long I could not get them through and you know that really hurt my um self-worth because I was really good at something and what the world had available for me to be involved in it that it was a um I could not use it. I could not, there was no way for me to manifest a gymnast out of this body with what was available in the world. So I also want to say to people in the world, you are very smart. That's you such... can come up with new things, new ideas that include everyone. This is why I talk about unique to fit. So Shan, like I dress people up to come and take pictures. I like everybody. Came, I went and made this dress specifically for me because I couldn't find it in the world, and that made me feel good. So, you know, people grow. Take time to think about what is happening around you, and to be honest, it's a it's a beautiful world. Uh, life is the reward, and you don't have to be any specific kind of way to be rewarded by life. Hmm. That's beautiful. I don't know why I'm through the you, you're talking about the the impact of the pandemic and and stretch marks and, and all these things. And uh, I just I've been watching the the Disney, the Cars movie franchise with my little guy. And I don't know if you guys are familiar with it or not, but Mater, the tow truck, he's got all these dents and they were talking about cleaning him up in Cars 2. They're going to clean him up so he can go he can go international and he can look good. And he's like, hell no. Like, he loves his dents. His dents tell a story, you know? And I, I think that there's something... The Disney movies always are, are operating on different levels, the sublime and the obvious, but uh, I just thought that was beautiful. Um, I, I want to give everybody an opportunity for, for closing remarks. I know that, that we have to be fair to you and let you get on with your day. Um, Adora, so much stuff for us to reflect on there, and I so appreciate it. Um, Shannon, how about you? Something, something that we should walk with today. Give us something to take with us. I think having these fruitful conversations is so incredibly important when we're talking about like as an activist, what can we do? I'm a huge activist. Um, Adora is Ashley is like having these discussions and without it being taboo is huge. Go and do something in the body that you're in today. Go through and throw out all your diet shakes, go through and start teaching your children the better foundation that maybe you didn't have. Let's stop complimenting people on losing weight the moment that we see them. Like there's all these types of actions. Go read, <laughs> go go do these things, grow, learn, go see psychologists like Ashley, like go do the work and, and have fruitful discussions and go do hard things. I think that's, and you matter. <laughs> that's I love the main it. thing, you matter. Ashley, you're, you're the one that kickstarted this whole round table. Um, it's been one of the most powerful in the show's history. I've never seen the audience responding like this before. Um, we'll give last word to you. Thank you. It's been an honor to, to have the forum to do this. So thank you, Ryan, for doing that. Um, I guess my, my takeaway would be awareness and language. So be aware of, you know, I know there was a commenter who had said, I don't like my body. I hate my body. I want you to know that if you feel that way, you're not failing. You're not bad. You're not wrong. You feel that way for a reason, though. And so I would encourage people to be mindful of, you know, what have I internalized? What beliefs have I internalized? Because I've been, I've grown up in an environment where they're everywhere and I'm being bombarded. But, you know, we talked about the word fat earlier, and there's definitely a subset of the population that's reclaiming it, like Shannon was explaining about it being a neutral term, which is beautiful. But so often I hear people use it in a negative way. And, you know, this, this phrase of like, I feel fat, it's something I hear all the time. And I know that feels true to a lot of people, but what I would encourage people to do is if you're saying like, I feel fat or I feel ugly, I want you to go underneath that and go, what emotion are you actually feeling? Because it's better information because believe it or not, fat is not an emotion, right? We don't say I feel fingernails. We don't say I feel hair. It's a part of our body. So I want you to think about, do you feel anxious? Do you feel worried? Do you feel insecure? And, and kind of dig a little bit deeper here. Um, and remember that, Again, your body is an instrument, not an ornament. Your body, our purpose of having a body, again, isn't to be looked at and admired. Our, our purpose of our body is to carry us through this life and to let us experience things. 
And so I really encourage people to come back into our body and stop worrying about other people's experience of the body and, and focusing more on what does it feel like to be here? Because as, as Adora said so beautifully, it's a privilege, uh, particularly in a pandemic. And if we come out of this thing with a few extra pounds on because we stayed at home to keep our loved ones safe and we, if you're like me, ate maybe a little bit more uh, mashed potatoes and cookies and uh, whatever other food is comforting, I think that's a huge success. I can't tell you how much uh, this means to me that the three of you not only showed up, uh, but that you wore your hearts on your sleeves as advertised um, and that you'd ins- you, you've inspired our audience in a remarkable way. And I know this is just the beginning. Um, this podcast will be shared many times. People are going to watch this YouTube video maybe two, three, four years from now. Uh, and every single person who does, it's inevitable. They're going to take something valuable from it. Um it's it's incredible the voices that you've brought to the table this this morning and I, and I'm so grateful for it. Photographer Shannon Smith, uh, Adoran Wolfor out of out of Calgary, Ashley Wanamaker uh, out of Calgary as well, registered psychologist. Um, as we want to shine a meaningful light on Eating Disorder Awareness Week, thank you sincerely to the three of you. Thank you as well. Thank you so much. Uh, Real talkers, I want to thank you as well for. Your conversations, the, the tweets. Um, I, I've just uh, I've just retweeted something from from Emma, which is is uh, I mean it's it's heartbreaking. Like I, I'm so grateful that so many of you are sharing your firsthand experience. I do not take that lightly. Um, if you follow me on Twitter at Ryan Jesperson, you can see it. If you follow Emma Didi on Twitter, you may already. If you don't, you should. Um, she shared a photo. Of, of of these adorable young people uh, participating in ballet, but the background to the story says so much more. And she says, I'm so glad you're having this conversation. This is a photo of me around the first time I began to compare my body to others. Emma in the photo is probably four, maybe five. She says, I thought my legs were so fat in my little pink ballet tights. And when I look at how small my slippers were, it just breaks my heart. That from Emma. Remarkable. Uh, Brandon says, what a fantastic panel of women. I've seen there's a little dust up happening in the chatterbox. I don't know the root of that, but um, generally speaking, um, I so appreciate the tone today, especially considering the subject matter and how personal this hits for so many people, including me. And I really appreciate what you bring to the table, Real Talkers, each and every day. We're so grateful for the support of the team at Park Power that allows conversations like this to happen. Of course, you know they power our hashtag, Real Talk RJ. Uh, Park Power right now at parkpower.ca is, well, they're dangling a pretty appealing offer to you. If you bring your natural gas, electricity, internet business to them and use the ha- the uh, promo code 2021-REALTALK, they're going to give you 70 bucks off your first bill, whether it's a commercial or residential contract 70 bucks off your first bill using the hashtag 2021-realtalk at parkpower.ca if you go to ryanjesperson.com and check out the sponsors tab you'll find alta moving in storage there you can find them at altastorage.ca as well they've got these pod style containers if right now you're resolving that this year you're moving that's it you've had enough you're going to improve your situation you're going to find a better fit call the team the locally owned and operating team at alta moving in storage these pod style containers allow you to move at your pace in a way that's convenient to you. They take the stress out of it. It's what they do best, plus long and short-term storage solutions at Alta Moving and Storage. The team at Eden Landscaping is ready to go at landscapeeventon.ca right now. They know that it's freezing cold. They know that the snow is falling across the prairies right now. And they also know that by the time spring and then summer hits, you're going to be ready to make the most of your outdoor living space. So why not tap into their 20-plus years of experience from planters and flower boxes all the way through to retaining walls and total overhauls, landscapeedmonton.ca is where you'll find Eden Landscaping. And the team at Grand Dog Essentials, we are so proud to be partnering with them. Uh, Quality raw dog food. They've got a team, their team is family owned, but a team of, of, of nutritionists that can help you understand if raw might be the best diet for your dog's health. Sure was for ours. Uh, both of our dogs have been eating Grand Dog Essentials quality raw food for, well, for the entire time that I've known about the business. A few years now. 
uh, and they're proud partners of Real Talk as well. Use the promo code Real Talk for 10% off your first order on their website. You can link to that through ours. And the team at Friesen Brothers uh, getting set for March 5th. Circle that on your calendars. Friesen Brothers opening their 15th Alberta location in South Edmonton, that Rabbit Hill location that everybody's excited about. All I'm going to tell you is they've got a pizza oven. They've got a grill there. They're going to be doing up burgers and craft beer on tap. What? At Friesen Brothers in South Edmonton. And finally, a shout out to the team at Local Waste. We've got a ton of submissions for Trash Talk this Friday. Comes up in the 10 o'clock hour. Local Waste is the proud presenter of that. And they love talking trash, including earning your business. So whether you're a small operator in a small business situation or a huge one. I mean, you own a shopping mall. Local Waste wants to compete for your business. You can check them out online at localwaste.com. CA. They've been doing this for more than a quarter century. What a show it's been. Uh, the conversations we've had, absolutely remarkable. We're already working on tomorrow's show. You're not going to want to miss it. Art Price is going to join us. The former CEO of Husky Energy has a lot to say about how the different levels of government have managed that Keystone XL file. We're also going to check in with Nicole Rycroft, a big environmental award, three million bucks to channel toward new programs. And Chrissy Stroop will join us by audience demand. That's coming up tomorrow on Real Talk.